Hello, everybody. Welcome into my latest live broadcast. It's Friday. It's a Friday show. And thank you guys so much for joining me today, February the 16th, 2024. And, you know, normally, normally I wear one of my branded shirts on Fridays, just because. <laughs> and uh, today we're doing a, kind of a celebration of the dragon, if you will. And I thought I'd wear a dragon appropriate t-shirt for celebrating with our friends in China, their Chinese Lunar New Year or Spring Festival, Year of the Dragon this year. And that goes on for, well, from a week to two weeks, depending on the company, they shut it down. So uh, if you're ordering any like mini PCs or things from China, they're accepting orders, but may not be shipping until the end of this big, big holiday. That, it just depends on the company, just like here in the US when we have Thanksgiving, some people get off early on work on Wednesday and they don't have to come back to work till Monday. Other people, especially people in retail, uh, they'll be working the Friday immediately after and maybe even the weekend too. So much like the similarly, I suppose, in, in China, depending on the company, they could be off for as little as a week and as much as two weeks. So just so you know, all of this should be behind us I want to say around the 20th or so of the month and everything should be back open and business as usual. Could have the date a little mixed up, but somewhere around there. Uh, thanks to our friends at Acronis for supporting us here and offering you guys a great discount on any of their software. Be sure and uh, watch our previous videos if you have not before on how to use Acronis. I hope you're backing up your computer. Life is chaotic and things often don't make sense in our, the, the, the things that blindside us and surprise us, unexpected events, will they happen to our computers? If you've had a computer for some time, I'm sure you've experienced that at least once. I hear people say, oh, I should back up my computer before I, and then, you know, fill in the blank, update, upgrade, whatever. That's like saying, uh, I don't normally have car insurance, but since I'm going on a long road trip, but we all know statistically most car accidents happen within five miles of where you live. So car accidents are absolutely and always unexpected. And when you need a backup, it won't be for what you think you're going to need it for. Something's going to happen that you didn't plan on. And everybody who's ever lost data regardless of all the hundreds of different causes for losing data from failures to fires to floods to just the product failed, data corruption, viruses and ransomware. I, I, I could go on and on. Uh, the one thing everybody who's lost data has in common is none of them expected it and that's why they didn't make backups. So you wanna make your backup so you have peace of mind. And Acronis makes it easy. And it may sound like a sales pitch, but I use Acronis. And I don't care if you use Acronis. What I do care about is that you're backing up your data regardless of whether or not you think you need to, unless you just don't care if the data you've got on your drive vanishes. Or you don't mind paying thousands of dollars to a data recovery company to back it up for you, assuming it's even possible. Because when your data is gone, depending on what caused it, data recovery may not be able to get it all back or any of it back. And it's very time consuming and very expensive. You could do your own data recovery for pennies in 10 minutes or, you know, a fraction of the time data recovery takes by being your own data recovery and simply restoring your backup. So if you've got a backup solution and you back up regularly because we only add more data, we all have more data this year, each of us, than we had last year. So the losses get bigger and bigger the, the longer you put it off. And it's your losses. Nobody cares about your data except you. So if you can't be bothered to back it up, you know, it's hard. It, it, there's nothing more anybody else can do. In that sense, our friends at Acronis are offering you all a 30% discount, and we have a tutorial walkthrough if you're not quite sure how backups work. And you can follow along with us click by click using the free trial of the software, and you'll have a backup, okay? Even if you don't buy Acronis, keep that backup 
because restores are always free from Acronis. You don't have to have a license. Now, that backup might not be very useful to you in a year when you've added a bunch more data and you haven't backed it up since then, but it's better than nothing. Uh, but decide for yourself. And again, if you already have a backup solution in place, great. Don't fix it if it ain't broke. Our friends over at Instant House Call, that's the remote support software that I use. And that helps get me attached to my customers remotely so I don't have to get in the car, spend all that time in the car. And my customers get fixed faster and I can help more customers each day so I can make more money. And I reduce my expenses and my risk because I don't have to get in the car in Phoenix traffic. Instant House Call also has a free trial and a discount for our viewers. And we have a tutorial walkthrough on that here in our video library. And we can walk you through, download, install, an example of how it's used. And of course, finally, just two others. RoboForm, the password manager I've been using for well over a decade and a half. There's a discount for all of you, 30% off new customers. And um, VIP CDK deals. How can I forget them? I use them all the time. That's where I get my Windows license keys and my Office license keys. You buy an Office... Uh, you can buy a Windows 10 license key for less money than a Windows 11 license key. And that Windows 10 license key will activate your Windows 11 without having to install Windows 10. Just make sure if it's a Windows 10 home license that you're activating a Windows 11 home operating system, not Pro. And if it's a Windows 10 Pro license, then that will activate a Windows 11 Pro operating system, but not home or enterprise. It's got to be the same version. And then, uh, oh, Office. They have the, the last version of the perpetual license of Microsoft Office that doesn't require you to have a Microsoft account to activate it is also the cheapest, Office 2016. So that's like around, it's under $30. And uh, you just enter your license code just like you would for Windows. No Microsoft account is necessary. I'm not against Microsoft accounts. I just, it's unprofessional for me to log into my personal Microsoft account and activate a customer software with my account or to even have my account cached information on a customer's machine, which is not only a security risk to me, it's very irresponsible. So uh, it's unprofessional. So for me, that's why I don't use one. But if you use one, that's great. There's many advantages to having a Microsoft account when it comes to activating Microsoft software. Uh, that being said, after the show yesterday, I stopped by uh, Patrick's studio. Patrick has a YouTube channel here called Serve the Home, and he loaned us some equipment that they reviewed and didn't need anymore so we could review it. And uh, we call it the library. I go over to Patrick's place and he's got shelf after shelf after shelf of stuff. And he's got the good stuff. I'm talking business class machines, business class switches and hardware. And it's the stuff you drool over. And here's the thing. All this consumer stuff that you guys see, especially like when you go shopping at Best Buy or whatever, that's all crap. <laughs> when you see the business class stuff, it is so much more powerful, so much better built. And it's a lot more expensive. But here's the thing. Here's what I figured out. Having worked in corporate America and I've done work, you know, for the consumer. Every consumer, generally speaking, would love a business class computer. It would be very good for security, reliability, ease of working on it. But they wouldn't like the price. But there is no business that I can think of, of any substantial size, where a consumer-based computer would be a better solution. So what's good, whatever the businesses are doing, that's also good for consumers if they want to also do the same sort of practices that businesses use, big businesses. But it doesn't work the other way around. What consumers do is not good for businesses. And I think there's something valuable to be learned there. Now, I'm over at Patrick's studio yesterday, right? And he's got this cabinet and he opens it up and it was like, oh, there's all these mini PCs and they're just sort of put in there, wrapped in bubble wrap and 
upwards and downwards and sideways. And I said, what's in there? He says, I have no idea. Have a look. <laughs> so I'm like a kid in the candy store. And uh, I'm like, oh yeah, uh, B-Lane GTR, I've done that one. Uh, you know, whatever, Intel Nook 12, I've done that. And then I see this. Let me bring this up to the camera so you can fully appreciate this. <laughs> There's no label on this. It's just blank. I said, Patrick, what's this? Now, what I love about Patrick is it doesn't matter what he's got in his inventory. It is the best thing ever. And it, it's so, I don't know, I find it amusing. I don't, <laughs> I, I'm a little more... <laughs> reserved over you know my excitement for product but every single time i asked what was this you know, like i started to catch on because i thought you know the first time he did it oh wow you know that's special but then everything i grabbed was special you got to appreciate his enthusiasm i love it i absolutely love it and he looks at this and he goes oh again he's really excited do you know what this is this is an intel nook prototype that they sent us and I said, what is it? He goes, I have no idea. <laughs> he says, I, I don't remember. Like, he's got a thousand things going on, right? And I'm the same way. Well, I took this home and I fired it up. And it had never been turned on before. Like, it was still going through the original Windows 21 H2, Windows 11 setup. It had never, as far as I can tell, never been powered up. And then I was looking at the case and I, I don't see any screws. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if that just... You know, I'm just kind of pulling on it, then it opens up, and then we find out it's a uh, Nook 12. So guess what? I'm going to be reviewing later. <laughs> now, they do sell the Nook 12 still, but not like this. That is the weirdest thing, and it's another sneak peek behind the scenes of what some reviewers get that the rest of us don't. Um, and, and I was just like... Please, 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 may I, may I borrow this? Take it. Just take it. And I go, I said to Patrick, oh, I'm keeping this. He goes, okay. I said, no, I'm kidding. I'm not going to keep it. But he was like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, along with seven other mini PCs that I've got, and again, every time I'd say, like, what's this? And he goes, oh, oh, this is really good. <laughs> and I'm like, you're so excited. So, but it also is infectious. It's got me excited. So I can't wait to bring you this content. And of course, when we get through it all, <laughs> Mara's going to kill me because she's got to make a thumbnail for everything. And she's very detail oriented. And just in an hour or two, I come back with like seven mini PCs and, a, and another device. And I'm like, I'm going to need thumbnails for all of this. Anyway, um, hopefully we'll be getting to that most of that next week. And then when we're done, back over to Patrick's, return it all, and back to, sh to checking out more things from the library. It was actually another thing that was new in a box that he, he said, yeah, you should review this. It was like a Lenovo workstation, a little one. And I thought, oh, yeah, that would be great. And then <laughs> with my hands full of mini PCs and Patrick carrying some other stuff, I loaded it into the car and completely forgot there was still that box. So that's okay. It's not going anywhere. Just pick it up next time. But uh, I was, he's such a fun guy. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Serve the Home YouTube channel, be sure and check it out. He's full of energy and excitement, and it's quite infectious. And a lot of it is going to be business class stuff, but there's a lot of overlap and home lab stuff. So mini PC reviews. And, you know, he was trying to, He's like, why don't you review this uh, uh, single board chip, you know? And I'm like, hmm, that's Raspberry Pi level stuff. I don't do that. Why don't you review this switch? It's a really cool business switch. You know, I just, I don't know how to make that sexy. I don't know how many home users are going to want a rack mounted switch. He's like, man, you're, you're tough. <laughs> I'm like, I just, I appreciate that you're offering. I just, uh, I'm just trying to think what I can present to my audience that they would find of value and enjoyable, entertaining. So what else you got, you know? So that was fun, it was fun. All right, now uh, let's see here in the chat room, 
We've got a few contributions. Let me give some shouts out to these generous folks. I have to get my, I have to get my page up. My viewer activity page is what I need to see. There it is. All right, Craig Casabona. He sent in a $20 super chat before the show started. He says, hey, Kerry, I just built a brand new Ryzen 5 8500G with an ASRock B650 PG Lightning motherboard. Nice to see you live again. Thanks. Out of curiosity, Craig, did you, um, did you turn down the, uh, the PBO, the Precision Boost Overdrive, or did you, are you letting that thing run at 95 when it's working hard? I'm just curious. I mean, AMD says it's okay. But at Cryos contributes $5 in Super Chat. He says, hello, everyone. Dragon Breath. Mine is Dark Dragon. Love all the nicknames. Let's get this fire breathing started. Yeah, we're going to get there here pretty soon. Just want to get through saying hello to everybody and thanking you for your contributions. Again, you can, uh, Planet Cryos with a $5 Super Chat says, I still have yet to do a build video with my MSI Meg Ace, maybe in a month or two. Yeah, this is a super high-end motherboard. This was about 600 bucks when it was new, and Amazon's selling them for 250 bucks right now. You still got to find a processor, RAM, storage case, power supply, put an operating system on it. And, and you know, you don't want to put a cheap CPU in a $600 motherboard. You know, that's 14900K written all over it. You know, go big or go home if you're going to go this route. And, of course, this motherboard is dragon-themed. So everything's dragon themed today. Thank you, Planet Cryos. And be sure and check out his YouTube channel. He's got a few build videos and reviews there. He does a great job. And show him a little love and support. Get over there and not right now, but after we're done today, check out his channel. If you haven't, give him a few thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you, Planet Cryos. Victor Collender with a five pound contribution says, hey, Carrie and camera girl and chat, have a great show all the way from London. Right on. Thank you, Victor. Or cheers, I suppose I should say. There's Dom Parada with a $9.99 contribution. To Kerry Holzman, first of his name, the unburnt king of marine, king of, I don't know what this is. <laughs> Alice of the great grass sea breaker of chains and father of dragons. Wow, you just really set up a lot of expectations. I'm only going to let you down from this point forward. Thank you for that, Dom. Colin Hunt, joining us from England with a five-pound contribution, says, good evening and happy Friday. Good to see everyone. Thank you, Colin. Nick Caffrey with five euro says, hello, Carrie, Mara, and chat. Hope everyone is well. And greetings from a wet west of Ireland, where it's 11 degrees Celsius, which is 52 degrees Fahrenheit. You know what? That sounds beautiful. In a place where I live, where we don't get much rain and we don't have much greenery, I think I would enjoy that, at least for a little while. I suppose after a while it would, might get a little depressing, but so does living in a tan desert with nothing but cactuses, rattlesnakes, and scorpions. That's overcrowded and everybody's being rude to each other. I assume, I assume people treat each other nicer in Ireland and it's not so crowded. I've never been there, but uh, maybe Mara and I need to take a trip soon. Thank you guys so much for your support and helping keep us independent here on the channel. So we're free to bring you the builds we want to do, the reviews we want to do, when we want to review them, how we want to review them, and say whatever the heck we want to say without requiring any manufacturer's cooperation or approval. You have no idea how rare this is on the internet because it costs a lot of money. And without your contributions and without your memberships, half of the videos, easily half, would not be possible. So I can't thank you enough for helping me to maintain that independence so I don't have to do what the other big YouTubers do and make commercials and be told what to say and have to submit the video to the manufacturer who's paying me to make sure that they approve it before I show it to you. And they call it a review. Obviously that's an advertisement, it's not a review. So everything you see before you today was all paid for with uh, your contributions. Now, a special shout out to our friend Frankie B. Because of Frankie's, again, a, a nice contribution, I was able to buy 
the brand new Thermaltake T300 computer case that just got released. Didn't, didn't Thermaltake make a T300, Tower 300 before? They did, but it's no longer a square. It's more like a, not an octagon. They cut the corners on it. So it, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it drastically changes the look of it. And I thought, let's not get it in black or white. We've done enough black or white builds. And so Thermaltake makes a lot of the uh, different colors of this Tower 300 or T300. But the only color they had in stock, because it just got released, was a... Um, Let's say it was a turquoise color. I'm not normally a turquoise guy, but I'm so hungry for something different. So that'll arrive next week sometime. And then there's a couple of accessories that can be ordered, but Amazon didn't have them. So I've got an email out to Thermaltake to see if they can help me acquire them, like a little LCD screen and a stand that allows you or enables you to turn the case on its side if you don't want it. Because the way it's designed, it you can, you can lay it horizontally, and they make a special stand. It's only like 30 bucks. Um, I don't think I would lay it down horizontally, but I'd like to have it to show it to you so you know that there's options. Anyway, um, we will... You guys can look forward to a build featuring those components. I haven't decided what motherboard and stuff I'm going to put in it. But I do have two of these boards and a Unify. MSI makes a, like the next level down from this big board, is, the next level down is Unify. And those were 200 bucks. So instead of 250 on this one, it was 200. And they're big, heavy monsters. They're well loaded with IO. They're very attractive. They're very heavy. And um, they were originally, you know, 500, $600. And in fact, let's go over today's parts. Let's talk about what we're doing. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you've seen me build and rebuild what our friend Mitch Morrison calls the robot's foot. Now, what the robot's foot is, is a core, um, it's a Cougar brand. Cougar's the name of the brand. RGB Conquer case. And that looks like... I don't think you can buy them anymore, at least not on Amazon. But that looks like this. Remember this? And we put a 13900K in it after we put a 10900K in it. So the 10900K came out, the 13900K went in, and I never got it finished. So the 13900K, the board and on RAM and storage, all that's coming out. And we're going to replace it with... This motherboard right here, the MSI Meg Z690 Ace. You can see the original price on this right down here was $549.99. They're in stock new with free delivery and free returns up to 30 days. You can see it's just an outstanding motherboard design. And couple of different angles here. We got Thunderbolt on this bad boy too. So that's what those ports are. Now, uh, we don't have any video out on this except that USB-C port right there on the bottom, the horizontal one at the bottom. That can be used to go USB-C to DisplayPort or HDMI. So we can get away with... Uh, using onboard video. Sneaky way to do it. Then we've got the Core i9-14900K. Wish I paid that little for it. It was, I think I paid $600 for it just two weeks ago. I can't remember. Maybe it was $569. Anyway, I didn't. The price has come down. It's much more appealing at that price. And then of course, the contact frame. Now, if a contact frame does anything at all, as far as benefiting um, heat and heat transfer to keep your CPU cool, it's going to be on an Intel chip, not on an AMD chip. And it's because the Intel chips are rectangular in shape, they could bend in the middle. And that, when I say bend, I mean so slightly you couldn't notice it with the human eye, but enough that it 
separates contact from the heat sink and the chip starts running hot and you can't seem to figure out why. So that's the idea. But does it actually work? I don't know. But I'm having fun putting them on and they're cheap. And I guess it doesn't really matter what they look like because once you throw a heat sink on top of it, you're never going to see it again. But uh, I'm just, for now, I'm enjoying replacing the, uh, the CPU hold down um, plate because I've never done that before. And it's, it's, I'm just enjoying it. And it's, it's not hurting anything. And it does look really cool in the building process. Uh, but will it help our heat? We'll find out. So uh, I've got a video coming up comparing the heat of a 14900K with and without the contact frame using a liquid cooler. I can't imagine it can make more than three to six degrees difference. So if your system's running that hot where three to six degrees Celsius makes a difference, I don't know what to say. It's pretty drastic. But I know the 14900Ks, they do run hot. And in, yeah, in this case, a six degree difference could get us back into the range that makes me more comfortable under load. So FYI, then the RAM we're using, this is some pretty nice high-end RAM. This is the Corsair Vengeance RGB DDR5. And each RAM module is 48 gigs of RAM, 48. Normally it's double, right? You go one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 10. This is not, this is weird. This is 96. So two sticks of 48. So what do they call that? Asynchronous? There's a word for it. Anyway, uh, 300 bucks. 300 bucks, but that's a lot of RAM. Two sticks. Remember, we've got four memory slots on this board, and we're only going to use two of them. In theory, we could double that. If we double it, however, we likely won't be able to enable XMP seems to not like, I mean, there may be some BIOS updates since I've heard this, but uh, I've never tried it. But anyway, uh, we're going to use two. And for storage, another $300 part. This is the Samsung 990 Pro 4 terabyte with speeds up to 7,450 megabytes a second. Because this is a Z690 board, Gen 5 was not available in the past. It didn't exist. So this is what this board supports, but it's got a lot of M.2 slots on it. And Gen 4 is no slouch. It's also way more affordable than Gen 5 right now in February of 2024. Also, I wanted to mention, this is a little off topic, but, you know, we had some issues doing the BIOS flashback with a generic flash drive. And for BIOS flashing, I like to use inexpensive small capacity drives preferably with an LED so I can see what the heck they're doing. If you're not familiar, BIOS flashback is, a, is an option some boards come with that enable you to update the BIOS on the board without any RAM or CPU installed. You just plug the power supply in and you put the flash drive in the right, there's a specific USB port you have to use and there's a button on the motherboard or on the IO shield on the IO panel and then it just like blinks a light at you. And typically when the light stops blinking, your BIOS is flashed. Now, why in the world would you do that? Well, when this board, for example, the Z690 board came out, it was designed for 12th or well, 13th gen Intel chips. There was no such thing as a 14th gen Intel chip. So the way this was designed, if you would take it brand new out of the box from the factory, a year ago and you put a 14 series chip in it it'll have no idea what that is because the bios isn't programmed to recognize it now i don't know how old the inventory is of what i've purchased this may have the latest bios not likely but it may have a bios on it now depending on how old the inventory is that recognizes the 14 series chips i don't know until i try it so I thought, let's, let's use BIOS flashback on this MSI. We did it before, and it was kind of a mess. I think I know what I'm doing now. Uh, and I believe it, one of the issues we had initially was we were using a generic flash drive that looked like it was doing stuff but didn't work. And all we did is switch the flash drive to a SanDisk, and it worked fine. 
And because it's a BIOS, it's something I was very nervous about because it never seemed to be done flashing and you never want to stop a motherboard or interrupt it while it's flashing a BIOS. And this process of doing BIOS flashback takes a good three times longer. On the other hand, if you can't get the board to boot because it doesn't recognize your CPU, the only other alternative you have is to put an older CPU in it and then flash the BIOS in the traditional way that I show and take that CPU out and then put your new CPU in. Most people don't have a spare CPU lying around. But I saw, I was reading up on Reddit regarding their process, what people are doing. And somebody was using these SAM data disks and it looked like it worked fine. And they have um, LEDs. What's interesting is the LEDs vary. Like on the, on the blue and the black drive, it's a little pin LED on the butt of the drive. But on the red and the green and the blue, the LED is behind the plastic and it's like a translucent plastic and it's really bright. You can't miss it. So they have this sort of um, combo where they're including one of each color. They're eight gigs a piece for 10 bucks, under $10. It's $2 each. <laughs> and these are great for like making Windows installation media, maybe a mem test, uh, bootable testing uh, flash drive. Keep one for just moving small files or BIOS flashes. Uh, for two bucks, they're disposable. You know what I mean? Give them away. Say, oh, let me give you this file. And they're like, oh, thanks. I'll get the flash drive back to you. Nah, you keep it. It's yours. They're that cheap. And so far through my testing, apart from being a bit slow, what do you expect for two bucks? You're going to get about 10 or 11 megabytes per second write speeds out of them. But even at that, because the capacity is only eight gigs, you'll fill it up in like 12 minutes regardless. Now, a SanDisk drive of a USB 3 will probably do that in a quarter of the time, but it's a small amount of data. So, and it's a small capacity. And it's also only $2 and free shipping. And then finally, I was alerted to this deal last night about this little portable travel router, which is usually, I want to say it's about a hundred bucks. And this company is refurbishing them and it looks like they're not available right now, but they were available last night and I was made aware of the deal. 20 bucks, 20 bucks, like $19 and change. So the reason I'm showing it to you is first of all, you might not know what the purpose of a travel router is, but once you find out, if you travel, you're probably gonna want one. That's gonna give us some router content to cover I've never covered before. And again, the reason I'm showing it to you is this company that refurbishes or renews them, they will likely have more in the future. So you might want to just bookmark this or add it to a wish list on your Amazon, or you can, yeah, you can click add to list and just kind of watch it daily to see if it comes back. Because once word gets out, they go pretty quickly. So, uh, that's some content I'll have coming up for you when I receive it. But that was a fraction of what it normally sells for. I would not have bought it because I don't really need it. But for 20 bucks, <laughs> I couldn't say no. I mean, come on. <laughs> Besides, uh, I think I have a use for it here, actually. So we'll talk about that in the future. Now, with regards to the original robot's foot, if you don't know what we're talking about, this is the video from, gosh, when do we do this one? Oh, just eight months ago. We're already tearing it back down. Um, and then I'm trying to get you a shot of it all lit up. Here we go. It's, uh, of all the RGB systems I've ever seen, this one's my favorite. It's so different, it's so unique, it's so easy to work on. And the case was relatively inexpensive. For as much as you're getting, you're getting the RGB fan, you're getting these RGB uh, like tube lights, and you're getting this amazing case, these four pieces, five pieces of glass, uniquely cut and tinted for under $300. as a bargain. And again, the the whole motherboard tray slides out, which makes it super easy to work on. 
So if you didn't watch that video, you might want to watch it because this is what we're going to be upgrading. However, I won't be putting the motherboard into the case today. I'm going to have to have uh, help, I think, from our friend Mitch in the future to get this up on the counter. And we're going to take that board that we put in there. We're going to pull that out. And the board that we're prepping today will go into it. So one of the dilemmas I'm having right now is how I'm going to cool this. This really needs a liquid cooler on it, at least if you're going to work it hard. And uh, I want to be able to test fire this and make sure everything's okay. So I'm going to just think about that as we build, and I'll come up with something by the time we get there. Now, before I start the process, let me just take another look here in the chat room and see what you guys are saying. And I've missed, I have missed <laughs> a few contributions. So thank you, a shout out uh, to my friend here, DJ Big Red. He contributes $4.99. He says, I'm showing my mom your channel. Hi, mom. You got a good son. Roy Starman with a $10 super chat says, it's been a while. Work interferes with free time. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> Thank you, Roy Starman, for your support. Andy Kane, five euros. Says, afternoon, Carrie in chat. Happy Friday. Glad to contribute. Brilliant community and great family to be a part of, as always. Thank you, Andy, for being a part of it. And thank you for supporting the channel and the community. Uh, let's see. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Nick Poverman says, 90% of people would never need this much RAM. Yeah, 640K ought to be enough for everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Today. 96 gigs of RAM today. Yeah, you're right. 90% of people today wouldn't benefit from it. If you have more RAM than you're using, what's the point of having it? You're not using it. Your system's going to run exactly the same at 32 gigs as it does at 96. Why spend the extra money? But this is no ordinary system. 90% of people wouldn't spend $550 on a motherboard or $600 on a CPU or $300 on RAM and $300 on storage. And we haven't even gotten to the case, the cooler or the power supply yet or the operating system, although we'd get that cheap. So what do we got? I mean, if we paid retail, 550 plus 300, 850 plus 300, 1150 plus 600, 1750. So we're, we're $250 shy at two grand before a case, power supply, and cooler. Cooler can set you back 250 bucks for a serious cooler. To, it's got RGB that's gonna be adequate for this motherboard, right? Just to keep everything on par. You wouldn't wanna put cheap, crappy little tires on a new Ferrari. And then of course the case, that's a $300 case. We wouldn't wanna just put a bland, ugly, case and then have all these stellar components inside, I guess, unless you were looking for a sleeper. But if you're looking for a sleeper, you certainly don't need the fancy RGB and you don't need the, the dragon. I mean, if nobody's going to see it, what's the point? You could buy cheaper stuff. Let's be honest here. The, the, uh, all these extra aesthetics cost extra. Extra cost extra. And if you don't need the extra, don't buy it. What I'm building here is not for the average ordinary person unless you've got extra money burning a hole in your pocket and you enjoy the process. In fact, I don't even need this. I have invested this money using contributions and membership money to bring you guys content. So let's not mistake why we're doing this. You get to live vicariously through me to wonder what it's like. Most people, if you're like me, would say, wow, what's it like to put together a $3,000 or $2,500 computer? It's sort of like watching car reviews. Do you want to watch the car review of the Kia Forte? Or do you want to watch the car review of the latest uh, Lamborghini, Rolls-Royce, Ferrari, Bentley, Rimac? You ever seen a Rimac? Holy cow. Or heck, uh, where's another one? 
give me a minute. It's a Holland car company that we've never heard of here. They've been around for a hundred years. They used to make planes. Spider. No, Spider's the name of the car. S-P-Y-D-E-R. I can't think of it. You very rarely will ever see one in the United States. But a lot of things that we would never likely buy in our lifetime, we still want to watch the reviews and kind of see what it's like. What's the interior like? How many people have sat in a Ferrari? You know, I see them in Scottsdale up and down the roads, but um, I've never sat inside of a Ferrari. I, only virtually have I seen the steering wheel and dashboard lack of cup holders or a Porsche for that matter I was mentioned and that's nowhere near as expensive so this is kind of like that right uh, our friend Anthony Remus over at Remus computer solutions he builds really high-end workstations of this caliber and then finds a stable overclock for them extreme cooling it must take days to fine-tune it so it's stable and then he sends those to companies that do uh, CAD work, computer-aided drafting. And he's so busy, he can't keep up with the orders. And the amount of time it takes him to build one computer, I will have built three. And of course, the amount of, of money he charges is probably no less than three times what I have to charge. Plus, he's giving his customers a three-year warranty which means he has to have spare motherboards on hand because if the board only came with a one-year warranty or if the customer, remember this is a business, if they send that system back for repair and the board is under warranty, the customer can't wait for that to get shipped out and come back. They can't be down a month. So Anthony has to buy extra parts like boards and keep them on hand depending on how many he sold for potential warranty replacement. And then he can get the customer back up and running quickly, RMA their board, and it doesn't matter how long it takes because when it comes back in, it'll go back on a shelf. And they'll have dates on them, I imagine, so that when a certain amount of time passes and there are no longer any customers under warranty, he can then sell the parts or give them away. It's all a tax deduction. and. You know, he could use it for himself personally, whatever. But at that point, he's just cluttering his shelf if he keeps it there after warranty. And that, of course, means he's going to have to charge more for the systems. But these are systems that are, you know, routinely eight to $15,000 a piece. You know, high-end graphics cards, extreme packing because he ships across the nation. Um, he has pretty well perfected the shipping process, which is way over the top for what I do. And if you're interested, uh, check out Remus Computer Solutions. And I think he has a YouTube channel, but he definitely has a website. You can look at some of the work he does. And you can follow him on Twitter where he's posting pictures of the stuff he's doing with little stories about what it is and you know what some of the challenges were and little short stories. And it's a lot of fun to follow him. And if you're watching, Anthony, Anthony helped us with our Threadripper's Revenge video because I was very skeptical having a two-year nightmare of getting the original Threadripper build working reliably. And through Anthony's help, when we built Threadripper's Revenge, it worked on the first power on and has worked ever since. In fact, that system was sold locally to a custom customer here for about five or six grand. And they're using it to run multiple virtual machines. And yeah, they're, they needed it and they're loving it so i don't have that one anymore but i still have the original threadripper build which was a community funded project and that's what i stream from at studio a and now that we've got all the issues worked out it works great of course it's obsolete but it's more than we need for broadcasting it's really um an emotional part of the channel it's a piece of the channel i don't i don't think i'll be able to part with it ever we put everybody's name on the front of it that contributed and made it possible. And uh, what a disappointment it was to just have weird random crashing and RAM compatibility issues. And I was so mad at spending all this money for something so unreliable. But you know, we're back to the Ferrari conversation. Nobody buys a Ferrari because they're reliable. 
or because they get good gas mileage. So when you're in that category of financially, you're in it for the power and you just pay people to fix it. <laughs> anyway, after two years, AMD got all the issues worked out. And so now it works great. Sari says, stop showing me stuff. I'm still struggling not to buy Kevin and Bob. <laughs> Take my money. Uh, Matt says, I guess I'm blocked again. No idea what you're not blocked here. We wouldn't be able to see you. Uh, Bajan guy says, hey, Carrie, I remember those 640K memory days. Oh. Back in the uh, 80s, early 90s. Cerise says, $250 is a steal for this board. I paid $450 on sale two years ago. And no regrets, it's a nice board. Agreed. That's why I bought two of them. And so did Planet Cryos. He's got, he's got at least one of these, and he hasn't built in it yet. He also got the Unify, and the Unify is just one step down from this, and it has no video out on it at all. You will have to put a GPU in that. So probably... But a KF processor, one that doesn't have a GPU, there's no point in spending the extra 30 bucks for a CPU that has integrated graphics when the motherboard won't output that. So we will, when we get to that board and do that build, we'll have to source a GPU for that. Bradley Morris renews his membership. He's now a member for 21 months. He says, thanks for all you do. I surprised my mom with a new Acer laptop last week. Not the fastest thing, but she loves it. There's a funny meme that was posted that cracked me up. And a customer said, I need support with my laptop. And the tech said, well, what brand is it? And the customer said, it's called Jade. Jade, there's no such manufacturer. So the customer took a picture of the Acer logo, which is their lettering in a funny font. And it's, it's upside, it's uh, mirror imaged. And it looks like it says Jade. Now, when you see it in text here in the chat room and you look at it, imagine it backwards, it doesn't it does it look like anything like Jade. But if you look at the Acer logo that's on their laptops um, and you mirror it, you flip it horizontally. Yeah, looks like Jade. <laughs> you can imagine how confused the tech was. What, what's a Jade? Let me see what you're talking about. It's like somebody saying, uh, there was another meme. Where somebody says, you know, why does my car show a picture of a man sitting on a toilet? And you're like, what are you talking about? And they take a picture of the dashboard where it says minus four degrees. And the minus four, if you Google this, you'll see it. If you look at it right, it kind of looks like somebody sitting on a toilet. I love that stuff. Uh, okay, so let me just take a quick look here in the chat. Make sure we're caught up before we get started. Rob wants to know, is performance on a laptop surpassed the performance of similar numbers on desktops? No. So laptops use different parts, right? So everything that they use in a laptop will be a mobile version of a desktop part. So a desktop part will always be better. As far as I can tell, unless there's a significant change in how parts are made, the desktop components are physically larger and don't have the size limitations and power limitations. And that's primarily why your desktop parts are always going to be slower compared to their equal uh, or you know, say you've got a 13700 CPU on a desktop, but a 13700H on a mini PC or a laptop. It's the equivalent, but the mobile version. So it's about a quarter of the physical size, maybe half. It, it runs on lower power in order to extend battery life on a laptop. And uh, it's no slouch. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting it's slow. But if you're asking, would a desktop component equivalent be faster? Always. Uh, a GTX 3080 graphics card is going to smoke a 3080 mobile chip on a laptop or a mini PC. 
That's just how it is. And that's, again, unless they change the, the design of how they make chips, it will always be that way. Always. So the answer to your question will remain the same. You don't need to ask that again and say, well, how about now? It's going to never change unless how they make the technology changes. And I don't see, I don't see quantum computing coming anytime soon. But when that happens, that might be the change you're lo looking for. Now, they do make some really fast laptops. Um, don't get me wrong. But due to the size limitations and power limitations, an equivalent desktop would be faster. Likely cheaper. The smaller components, including the battery, the keyboard, the mouse, the monitor, uh, the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all that that comes with a laptop, you're paying for all that stuff that you don't pay for when you're buying a desktop. You have to buy that stuff separately. The desktop's usually cheaper. Bradley Morris. Oh, wait, we, we talked about that. Thank you again, Bradley. Claudio says, I just saw a meme of the minus four degrees. LOL. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Why is there a man? Why is there a picture of somebody on a toilet? Okay. Uh, Alaj says, hello and happy Friday. Hey, Alaj, welcome in. Happy Friday to you, my friend. Lou Greeny is as nutty. Looks like he's been trashed and put away down and out. Aw. Nutty had a rough, rough week this week. <laughs> yeah, we'll let him supervise. Get him a cup of coffee. Uh, let's see. Claudio says, I just saw the Acer meme. It's upside down. Is that what it is? It's not reversed, but it's... Is it just upside down? Because when you lift a laptop screen, I, I, I can understand how a customer might do that. I mean, I believe that's real. Sometimes you never know if some, you know, oh, my CD tray is a cup holder. Like, I've never had a customer say that to me. And people that I've talked to in the industry, oh, it really happened to me. Really? Sari says, I worked at a dealership service station years ago when a woman called about a man holding a ball, and it was the airbag warning light. I saw one today. It was a service request from the dealer. The customer states, in fact, there's YouTube channels called Customer States. They're hilarious. Customer states problem with windshield cannot see when sun is shining into it. <laughs> Please fix. Please advise. <laughs> Wow. I mean, there's got to be more to that story. Maybe it's more reflective than they're accustomed to. Maybe the, the rake on the windshield, you know, the angle it's on. Maybe it's just reflecting differently and the person thinks there's something wrong with the windshield when the sun is directly, you know, shining into it. Can't see. Can't see when, well, nobody can see when I need Careful. That's what the visor's for. Alan Lindas mentions the Just Rolled In YouTube channel. I subscribe to that. I love that channel. And it's scary to see uh, the way people are driving their cars in this condition. They're very dangerous. And often the cars will be just barely drivable and completely not roadworthy. But they're mechanics. They're not police. They can't enforce, you know, forcing the customer to not drive the car. So a lot of times you'll see this stuff where the frame is disconnected from the rest of the car or the steering has been tied together with zip ties, the, the linkages, and it's customer denies repairs. It's like, well, of course, the customer's got no money. If you're driving that and you take it to a shop for work, I can almost guarantee whoever owns that car has no money for that repair. What were they thinking taking it to a shop? It's scary. It's very sobering to watch what people are driving, what they're t the condition of these cars. What they're, oh, they put vegetable oil in the radiator. No part of your car takes vegetable oil. Why would you do that? They're trying to fix leaks with spray foam. They're trying to fix brake hoses, brake lines with just rubber hoses. They have no concept how much pressure, how much hydraulic pressure is in those brake lines. It's so dangerous. Ah, I did it myself. Oh my God. 
gosh. If you're going to do it yourself, do it right. If you don't know what you're doing, take it to a professional. Uh, it's entertainment for the rest of us, but it makes me wonder when I'm driving next to a, some, some old junker hoopty on the freeway. This guy probably doesn't have insurance. That car may not have working brakes. The tires are probably bald. Yeah, I try to distance myself from those cars. Trevor Dune says, what do you think of Windows 11 new requirements? It needs, well, don't tell me what it needs. I posted this, <laughs> posted this three days ago. On the YouTube channel, there's a community tab and I, I hope you follow it because you'll get this news way earlier. But um, Microsoft has told us all along, you need an eighth generation or newer Intel chip to be Windows 11 compliant. And if you circumvent Microsoft's requirements, and you think you're getting away with something like, I got my Windows 11 installed on a fifth gen Intel, so it, Microsoft says you can't do it. Microsoft never said you couldn't do it. Microsoft said you shouldn't do it. And Microsoft said, if you choose to ignore our warning, you are not entitled to any updates. And what do people do? Well, the updates are working fine. Yes, yes, now, but maybe not tomorrow. And if they stop working, you have no recourse. There's n you, you shouldn't have put it on there to begin with. They, they warned you not to do it. You thought you were smarter than everybody else by circumventing the requirements and you're getting your updates and you're thinking, well, this is all a load of crap. They're lying. They're not lying. They're warning you. It's coming but they won't tell you when. And when it comes, you'll no longer be able to get any updates. You'd be better off with Windows 10. I warned you guys, and I'll say it again. If you have a computer that does not meet the requirements of Windows 11, you are going to be less secure. In fact, you're already less secure than if you would have just left Windows 10 on it. So if you're one of those people, I strongly advise you to go back to Windows 10 you will be far more secure and you'll continue to get updates until October 14th of 2025. This Windows 11 update, unless it changes, if it comes out this way, will be the 24H2 update, which may be out uh, this summer, maybe fall. You usually release it in fall. It will not install on your computer and there will be no bypass for it because it'll be a function that Windows 11 requires. It just won't work right. So what do I think of it? I think it's what, it's what Microsoft's been saying this whole time. I don't know why you guys think it's a lie. I don't know what you're thinking, but of course. What did you expect? Anyway, I don't get it. I just don't get what people are thinking. But hey, I appreciate the question nonetheless. Some funny people in the chat room today. Now, Jim kj 3 n mentions that as long as the CPUs since 2010, you should be okay. So not necessarily eighth gen in this case. And what Jim is suggesting is if your hardware, <laughs> and I, I don't know if this is true, but Jim's a pretty reliable source. He says, if your hardware, if your CPU is from before 2010, that's obsolete, that's an antique. So you have no, it's not reasonable to complain you're antique. It, what is it somebody said? My, my, oh, it was my friend, uh, it was Mike. He said, uh, my Ford, my 1929 Model T doesn't have USB chargers, what the heck? At some point you gotta, you, you hear that and you go, are you running a fever? Are you feeling okay? It's so unreasonable. Hey, there's our friend Gregory Howard joining us. Welcome in, Gregory. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, I think we're caught up. I think we're good. Okay. 
So, and you know what? We're right at the hour mark. So I guess the monologue and the chit chat. Done, we can move on. Let's take a look at what's in the box. This is all gonna be a surprise to me. I've never taken this out before and I've never worked with this particular model of board because I could never afford it. Look at that unboxing experience. It's heavy. Ooh. Oh. And then down here, underneath. Oh, more cardboard. Oh, it's a box. I like how they put the box within the box that was shipped to me in a box. Lots of stuff. You know, when you pay that extra money, you get extra stuff. Do you need it? You know, I can't tell you what you need. What do we got? Um, we got an ARGB cable. We've got a temperature sensor. Uh, it looks like an ARGB splitter. We have a display port output. Miniature display port to full size display port. Hmm, I don't know what that's for. We have a couple of SATA cables. A couple more SATA cables. Another temperature sensor. People online on the internet just, just obsessed with the temperature. We have another mini display port to full size display port adapter cable. We have a what appears to be a USB 2 extension. I don't know what that's for. We have a three pin to three pin. I don't know what that's for. We have a Go Faster sticker. You know, it's a fact. If you put these Go Faster stickers on your computer, your computer will go faster. And that is not true. And then we have some vinyl stickers. Ooh, these aren't paper. These are, wow. That's a really nice material. No, we'll set that here. We've got a microfiber cloth, I guess, if you want to spit shine some parts there on the board. We've got a little thank you card. We've got some cable labels. We have a quick installation guide. And we have a not-so-quick installation guide. What is this thing? It's a little tiny thing right here. What is that? There's a USB flash drive in here. What? Look at this. You know what? I'll just take it out of the package. There's a motherboard coming with a flash drive. Terry, didn't you research it before you bought it? Oh, have you just met me? A little branded USB flash drive. I wonder if it has drivers on it or if you're supposed to use this for flash in a BIOS. I don't know what that's for. Maybe, maybe read the documentation, Carrie. Well, let's not, let's not have some crazy talk. Let's not do that. We'll figure it out. And we've got, we've got our Wi-Fi antenna, external antenna for the built-in Wi-Fi. I love uh, an external antenna that has a base because if you're just sticking the antennas directly on the back of the computer, then the computer's blocking the Wi-Fi antennas, right? It's in the way. So this moves the antennas so you can get it up on top of the computer. Or... <laughs> it's like the days of rabbit ears in the 1970s. Hold on, I'm it just right there. Good signal. Isn't it great how much we've progressed in the last 50 years? Uh, and finally, there's one little, holy cow. What is this? 
Are you kidding me? <laughs> In case you have enough money to buy all this, but you can't afford a $3 screwdriver, they've included a little screwdriver, both Phillips and flat, on a little keychain, branded. Can you imagine? That would be torture to sit there and do this. To, oh my gosh. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. All right. It's impractical and pointless. Any opportunity to slap your name on something and give the customer a little something extra when they're paying this kind of money. We have a standoff and a small screw. This is likely for one of the many M.2 slots. And we have another one and a third one and a fourth one. So I think there's four M.2 slots. Finally, what is this? We have no idea what this is. Um, this appears to be some kind of a cleaning tool. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this is a first. And remember, when you're, if you want to know what it's like to live like a wealthy person, they're probably like, oh, doesn't every motherboard you come with come with a cleaning brush? There's your fine brush right there. And then down on the other side, there's your coarse brush. Anti-static carbon brushes so that you can, you know, brush away all your dust and your microfiber cloth. Have any of you ever done that to your motherboard? I use canned air. I'm not going to sit there and wipe down the heat sinks so that, you know, they wipe the fingerprints off or get the dust off for the microfiber cloth. I mean, I'll clean the case. I'll clean the keyboard. But really? Well, you know, you got a $550 motherboard. They have to put something extra in there to make you feel like getting something for the extra money. Bizarre choices of stuff here. I mean, the flash drive, the brush, and this, if you want to call these screwdrivers, um, could absolutely do without. I don't see any benefit to having these. But it came with the, with the motherboard, so I guess, I don't know. You might find another use for them that's more practical than whatever the heck they were intending. And I'm curious what's on this flash drive. Fresh viruses. I don't know. Maybe blank. Maybe it's just a branded flash drive. I don't know what size it is. I don't know what speed it is. But if it came with the motherboard, I'm not expecting much. It's probably not high performance or high capacity. And this is likely just how they're giving you the drivers, since most people no longer have optical drives. It says 16 gig on the side here, so I guess it's a 16 gig flash drive. Okay, well, bizarre. Gregory Howard apparently bought one of these and hasn't opened it up yet. He's given us $5 in Super Chat. He goes, well, now I know what's in the box I haven't opened. You and me both, brother. I uh, wasn't expecting that. Oh, you know what? I'm not even going to use this box. This, so I'm going to take all of the parts that uh, are left over, let's say, that we're not going to use or we're not going to use yet. And I like to put them in the empty motherboard box. So I need this box to be completely emptied because we're going to have a lot of stuff to put in here. And if I put any of that other cardboard back in, it reduces our capacity of what we can hold. So like we don't need the Wi-Fi antenna or the quick installation guide. I'm not going to be using these stickers. I do like these though. I don't know what that material, it's like a vinyl. It's not what I was expecting. It almost feels like, um, like a textile. Weird. A faster sticker. We'll just put these back in with care. With Carrie, that's me. We, we, we're going to put in the M.2 stuff because even though I'm not using all four M.2 slots, I believe these should be attached to the board with the screws so that you don't have to find where they are three years from now. 
they'll be right where you expect them to be. And I wish the motherboard manufacturers shipped the boards with them. What happens is if you have to send your board in for repair, in the unlikely event you have to do that, and you forget to take the little standoff and screw off, you will not get them back because they're, they're only warranting the board as it was shipped to you. And it was not shipped to you with these in it. It wasn't shipped to you with RAM, CPU, or storage in it, and you likely won't get those back either. So if you do have to send a board in for RMA from any manufacturer, they do warn you, but many people don't pay attention or they forget that these little standoffs and screws weren't attached because on some boards, Gigabyte comes to mind. Quite often they are already attached, but here's the thing. If you just take them off, regardless if they were attached or not, it's not going to void your warranty when you send it in. So if they end up sending you another board with them already on, you'll have extras. But let me tell you, there's a, a gut sinking feeling when you've created the RMA, you got approved, you have to package them, you know, take your RAM, your CPU out, put the socket cover back on, or your warranty is void if you ship it without a sock cover, socket cover. So you always want to save that, put it in the motherboard box, and just hope you never need it. Um, but it just, it's heartbreaking. You get your board back, and you go to put it all back together, and you realize you don't have the standoff or the screw to put your NVMe drive back in. So you can't put your system back together until you get that. So where are you going to get it? I mean, you can go on Amazon and try and find them, but these are very unique. You, you might be able to find them, but you'd be better off just reaching back out to the manufacturer and stating, hey, I sent these with M.2 standoffs and screws, and I didn't get them back. And then the manufacturer will say, well, you weren't supposed to chip with those. But typically, we'll, you know, we'll make an exception and we'll ship them out. And then you've got to wait a few more days for that envelope. It's going to be an envelope, right? Typically, a padded paper envelope will have the screws and standoffs in it. And they're going to let you know that it's your fault, not ours. And typically, you know, if you've never done that before, they'll say, well, we'll make an exception this time. Like, they're going to do you a favor. That's why I think these should always just be a part of the board. But not that many boards have to go back, you know, statistically percentage wise. So uh, because I'm a technician, I probably send back more under warranty boards than your average consumer by far. The scale of my operation is much bigger. But even then, it's been a couple of years since, you know, the manufacturing quality control is much better than it used to be. And it's pretty rare that a board fails under warranty these days, but it, it does happen. Wow, this thing is heavy. Holy cow. Now, let me bring it up to the camera. We can get a nice close-up look at what we got here for what is a $550 motherboard. We've got some stuff that has to peel off here. What does that even say before I peel it off? So I got to turn it the other way around. Mounting hole. <laughs> Great. All right. Like, that's not obvious. Um, we've got another. So this is a heat sink. You know what a heat sink does, right? It gets hot. And you know what plastic does when it gets hot? It has an unpleasant smell and it melts. Um, it's also very unattractive on your new board. So for all of these reasons, you see there's vents holes that this plastic is covering up. This must come off. I mean, you might get away with running the machine with it on there but it's gonna yellow and wrinkle. It's gonna look terrible in your systems. That chip, whatever's under there, your chipset or whatever's under there is going to run hot and you're gonna wonder why. And then we've got another one right here. And we have another one uh, right here. There's a blue pull tab here. Geez, you think for this kind of money, they would have uh, done this for me. Oh, I got another one just covering the, lo the brand name logo right up here. It's kind of hard to do this while holding it. 
You guys at home, when you do this, you'll likely have it sitting on something, right? And then you can just, uh, without having one hand trying to hold and balance this, you'll be able to easily remove this plastic. It's a little more of a struggle for me. And I guess the, I thought that plastic just tore on the IO shield, but it looks like it's actually in two halves because it's a straight cut. Oh, it's not a straight cut. I see what it did. It's just super thin around those USB ports. So the tension of the tape just tore it. I think that gets rid of all of our plastic. That's just there to keep it from getting scratched up or get fingerprints on it when it's in the manufacturing uh, boxing process. All right, let me pick this up and move it because I will slip on this anti-static bag and you're going to have a real entertaining show if that happens. At my age, I'll break a hip. All right, <clears throat> so here we go. Uh, the back of the board has a giant uh, protective backplate. Really nice. With an embossed dragon. That for nobody to see. <laughs> That's great that, you know, this is the part that nobody sees. Isn't it beautiful? And I just found another piece of plastic. This one on the gold top of this VRM heatsink. Ooh, no wonder why they included the microfiber cloth. That's super shiny. So I guess that's really just the polisher dragon and this gold, what looks like a gold bar, because that's going to show fingerprints really badly. Everything else is, is brushed aluminum. So uh, apart from the Meg, anything that's gold on this board. So it's going to be the dragon, this Meg logo, and this bar right here. Maybe that little triangle right there. That gold is underneath. Wait a minute, I'm feeling plastic here too. What is that? What is that? Hold on a minute. I'm going to put my glasses on and see that a little more closely. I hear it. Oh, that's just a little lid right there. I don't know what I was feeling. Strange. Now, when you're buying a board of this caliber, it's got a ton of I.O. That's pretty much what you're after, most people. Some people are after the look or the providence of it, right? But, but the, the, the true diehards, they want all of these USB ports and Thunderbolt, all of these USB connectors. And, you know, we've got two external USB 3.1s. We get two 3.1s. When have you ever seen that before? We have two USB 3.0s. When have you ever seen that before? Well, that's actually kind of common. We have two USB 2.0s. That, that's actually pretty common. Fan headers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, is that last one a fan header or is that something different? All right, five. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. There's eight fan headers so far. Let me just see if I'm missing anything. We have an audio header. These are the two temperature sensors. This is where they plug in if you want to use them. An ARGB header. Right in between this heatsink and this PCIe slot, there is a five pin single, single level. I don't know what you would plug in there. It's very narrow, especially if you had cards plugged in there. I don't know how practical that is, but it may be for service. It may not be for end user. Uh, looks like we have a... Um, who needs the manual? Just look at the board. We've got a power button and a reset button right down here, so I don't have to hook up my manual power switch. High-end boards typically have... A, a surface mounted power button. I just noticed we have a diagnostic LED right up here in the corner. I find these to be completely useless, but if it's moving, at least you know something's happening. A lot of times in my experience, they'll tell you you've got a RAM error or a CPU error. 
when it's something else earlier in the chain and it reports it wrong. So, you know, if, if the CPU is not functioning and it says your RAM's not working, it's because it can't get to the RAM because the CPU is not working. So it'll say you've got a RAM problem when you've got a CPU problem. If you're lucky, depending on what the problem is, it's not always wrong, but in my experience, it's just faster for me to, kind of with my experience, to take a guess at what I think it probably is rather than read the diagnostic codes. I find that to be mostly unrewarding and a waste of time. But if you're lucky, from time to time, they can actually be useful. The reason I like uh, the diagnostic LED is simply when it's booting, sometimes these bigger systems can take a longer post time. And you'd think, well, shouldn't it be faster? Oh, once it loads, it's faster. But the self-check, it doesn't boot up. It's got to check a lot more stuff. So like a Threadripper doesn't post as fast as a regular consumer chip. It's much more complex. But once it starts loading Windows, then you're, you know, the sky's the limit. So sometimes when it takes that long, I wonder, is it doing anything? But if I see the numbers on the diagnostic changing, that's what I want to see. If the diagnostic code never changes for like a minute or more, I think it's locked up. Um, and that's mostly a concern on a first time boot up or if the system, you know, after it's built for some reason doesn't turn on. But like if you've got a bad power supply, that's not going to help. If you've got a liquid cooler that's not working anymore, that's not going to help you. It's very limited in what it can do. And then what it does do isn't very accurate in my experience. We've got six SATA ports, two, four, six. I was looking for other fan headers here. We've got our M.2 here. We have an M.2 here, and then we have two M.2s here. So a total of four M.2 ports. I think these are all Gen 4, aren't they? Remember, Gen 5 was not invented or um, in, it wasn't deployed yet by manufacturers when this board came out. They didn't have a crystal ball, you know what I mean? To know what the standard was going to be. We have a few more headers up here. JLN1, JLN2, JSlow1. I don't know what any of that is. You have a real super teeny tiny header right there. What is that for? JTPM1, no idea. Down here, we have our, you know, traditional power switch, reset switch, power LED, hard drive LED header, front port header. We have another ARGB here. We have a three pin over here. I don't know what that's for. Oh, one is JBAT, so that's gonna be your battery, probably to clear the CMOS. And the other is JC1 and J, JBD. I don't know what those are for. I'm sure the manual will talk about it. And then we have a little diagram here on this funky connector that tells us what that's for. But even with my glasses on, that text is so tiny. Opening the manual or even a PDF on it will greatly help be able to identify what that is. Okay, so the diagram, this is interesting. This diagram I'm having a hard time reading is telling you what the pinouts are for this header all the way over here. Normally, they're much closer. So you've got to read. It'll say, it'll tell you what the label is. And here the label says uh, JP1. And if you look on the board, right underneath our front port header uh, pins, it says JP1. So that's how you know that that information that's all the way over here is for the header all the way over there. So the, the documentation at this level, when the font is that tiny, but that's going to be much easier to read. On the other hand, I knew what that was from experience, so I, whatever. All right. 
Planet Kraus with a $2 contribution says, there's five M.2, check my last contribution. Sorry, Planet Kraus, I've not been paying attention to the chat. I've been fascinated by this Meg. But yes, let me scroll back and see what else I've missed. Sari says there were drivers on the flash drive that came with mine. I went and got the newest ones off their site instead. Highly recommended. Good to know. Thank you for the info. Uh, what did Planet Crime say before? Oh, I see. He contributed, and I missed it earlier. Kerry, he says, with a $5 super chat, those display port cables are for the graphics out to go back into the motherboard and then to utilize the Thunderbolt out to feed that into something else. Yikes. Why would you need to do that? A video mixer? That's very specific. So you're going to loop it back you're going to loop it out of the GPU and back into the motherboard. I just don't know why you would do uh, Do you know why you would do it? And you don't have to contribute to tell me anything. You know, just put the at carry to draw my attention to your post. Lauren said that's an impressive selection of components, but no GPU. Well, if you think about it, Somebody buying this level of computer it is likely not going to want integrated graphics. It's like, wow, that Ferrari is really, really nicely built and supported, but why are there no cup holders? Probably don't want to drink inside of a high-performance hypercar, supercar, that's likely going to fly across the car and spill everywhere the minute you slam down on the gas pedal. Be careful what you ask for. So when you're at this caliber of build, it is assumed onboard graphics would not be utilized because they wouldn't be anywhere up to par with the rest of everything else you're building. Does that make sense? Why include something people are not going to use? So, all right, let me grab a cold Gatorade here. It also crowds the USB, uh, not the USB, it crowds the, the I.O. panel in the back. I mean, that's already got a bunch of stuff back there for data transfer purposes, right? Thunderbolts, lots of USB. And so now if we're going to add HDMI and DisplayPort. There's just no room for it. You'd have to get a little more creative. And usually somebody buying a board like this needs those USB ports, but they don't, as I previously already explained won't be needing the HDMI or display port. But again, we can get um, uh, USB-C to HDMI. Here I got a couple of those. So yeah, this is USB-C to display port, and that's a good six foot cable. You can get them really short for adapters, or you can run it right out to the back of the monitor with a longer cable. What is this? Oh, here's USB-C to HDMI. It's probably about a five or six foot cable. So the benefit of having a little adapter, say like this is display port to HDMI, and then I just use my regular HDMI cable that's already attached to my video capture card. I don't have to run a complete different cable or unplug the cable I've got and replace it with a longer cable. What I want is a shorter cable but I can use my existing cable to adapt. On the other hand, if you're running it to a monitor permanently, adding where you have an adapter is a likely failure point. So by having a solid cable, you're more likely not going to have any issues with the connections. And they're cheap, you know, like 10 bucks, whatever. Can a display to HDMI port pass 4K? Don't you have a 4K television? Of course, of course. Now, 8K, that's a different story. But I think even, even HDMI can, if it's the right version of HDMI, I believe it can do 8K, but I'm not positive on that one. I've never even seen 8K in my life, so I don't know what I'm talking about. 
But yeah, 4K televisions, how long have they been around? They're HDMI. All right, appreciate the question. John Paul Bacon, what's he talking about? It's normally $499. When I got my board, it happened to be on sale for $385. I do still make some audio CDs for personal use. Oh, what's he talking about, audio CDs? I'm catching the middle of a conversation with somebody else here in the chat room. And I don't know what he's talking about. Scroll. Scroll, Carrie, scroll. Let's go back and see if I can figure that out. Oh, he's got an Asus... John Paul Bacon says his current motherboard is the Asus ProArt. That's another high-end motherboard. The X670E Creator Wi-Fi. He plans to have it for at least two more years. Sure. Yeah, I would say, you know, that's easily a 10-year build, but uh, probably won't be up to meeting your standards in a couple of years. It's still going to work fine, but that won't be good enough anymore. As newer technology comes out, it's going to make your system look like a dog. For other people, depending on what their financial status is like, they could use that board likely for 10 years if need be. Jim KJ 3 n mentions the B650 Live Mixer has two USB 3.2 headers on the board. Those are the little ones, right? I, I don't recall seeing two little ones before, but maybe it was there and I just didn't notice it. But nonetheless, I'm not saying it's only on this board. What I am saying is it's not commonly found on boards. And when you're spending, you know, if you're missing the point I'm making, it's that when you're spending more money on the board, you're getting more. That sometimes some boards will have a little of something extra, right? Like the live mixer board. Um, but this has everything extra. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So if somebody says, if a motherboard is a motherboard, then why would you spend $600 when you could spend $150 if it's all the same? It's not all the same. It's not even close. And this is an ex uh, a description of the comparison between the two. And then you can say, well, I don't need all that crap. Okay, then that's not for you. You don't have to worry about it. Or you could say, hey, that's really useful. I, that would really make my life easier. I didn't know that. So that's the point of what I'm saying. So I just don't recall seeing all I'm saying. I'm not saying there's not another board that doesn't have those. I just don't recall seeing a board here that we've worked on that has the two USB uh, 3.2s. But I'm, <laughs> I've got a B650 live mixer right in front of me. And I could just look at it, but I can't be bothered because it's not the point. I do try to, I try to keep these videos on track. I really try. But sometimes when I interact with you guys, I can't help but I have to say something. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, nonetheless, I appreciate the information. All right. Let's, uh, let's get these little M.2 screws put in. And we're going to take these heat sinks off. we got a lot of them. Oh, I see. There's another M.2 here. So one, two three, four, five, five M.2 slots. Let's see if I've missed anything out. I'm sure I've missed a lot actually. So bear with me. It's all live unscripted. We do this all in one take and there's no rehearsal. Planet Cryo says there's not an M.2 under here. Well, where's the fifth one? Oh, I guess there isn't. What is that for? What is this for, Planet Cryos? You're right, there's no screws on here. What does it do? Is it just... You know what? That's just there for looks. There's nothing under it. It's not a heat sink. It looks like you would put an M.2 under there. I wonder if they were potentially making this available for an M.2. There is one board higher than this, right? The godlike board. Maybe the godlike board uses that as an M.2?
Planet Cryo says it's decoration. There's two under the middle one. Oh, so there's two here and two here and one here. Well, okay, that makes sense. And we're going to, I guess that's the next step is we're going to take these heat sinks off. We're going to put the screws on. And I guess I can use the top down camera to show this. So let me uh, get that hooked up. I did not plug it in prior to the show. So I hope our batteries are going to be good here. These Sony cameras just drain the batteries even when the cameras are off. It's so disappointing. You'd think that they were using nickel hydride instead of lithium. I don't know why they drain, and it's only the Sony cameras that do it. But I think we'll be okay. It wasn't that long ago that I charged it. All right, let's see. I always make the mistake of pushing this too far, and then I'm reaching. And I, it's really hard to work that way. Well, let me bring this to me and bring the camera to me. How's that for a concept, Kerry? <laughs> I'm not a camera guy. Give me a break. All right, let's go to our HDMI input and see if this is working, first of all. Nope. That's because it's not HDMI input. It's close-up camera. I got to pick the right input for that to work, don't I? What a difference it makes. Huh. Who knew you had to do it right? Okay. Why are we flickering? Loose. That is not pretty. Hold on. Seat the cable. Much better. All right. Live video. What do you expect? So let's see if we turn it this way. Bring it to me. We're going to take off this heat sink. Let's do that first. Get my glasses. Lauren wants to know, aren't Sony cameras overpriced? Well, look at the picture quality. You tell me. Go back and look at my videos using the Canon. I've had a variety of Canons, and I still have them. Ask the people in the chat what they think. Is it worth the extra money for the Sony? Sometimes you pay more, you get more. All right, there's our heat sink with thermal tape. And that is a uh, coolest design, so we don't need this. We're just going to swivel that to lock the uh, M2, M2 in place. I always like to use this slot first. What's interesting is there's a little diagram here, and you can pull this up in the manual if you want to pull a PDF of the manual. I don't know how well I can zoom into that. Give it a shot here. This way, zoom in some more. That's as far as the zoom goes. But this is telling us the M.1, sorry. It's going one, two, three, four, five. It's going backwards. And this tells us if it's PCIe or SATA or both. And it's got a Y, which I'm guessing is yes. So it's saying that M.21 is it a Y and an X? Is that what that is? Now I need those other glasses. See, these other glasses, I can't see anything with these because they're like 3X magnifiers. So I have to get close, like a macro. Uh, let's see. So looking at one first, PCIe yes, SATA no. Number two. You say, yes, SATA. Y and X are so similar. Why did they choose those letters? From what I can gather here, every one of these supports PCIe, but if you want to use SATA, only one, two, and three. No, I got it the wrong way around. Only four and five support SATA from the looks of this. Again, the manual is going to have that. Even the camera is like, that's so tiny, I can't focus on it. 
But if you're watching on a large screen, I bet you can read that much bigger magnification on your screen than I can see it here in real life. But essentially what it's telling you is if you're using SATA M.2s, only certain M.2 slots on this board support that slower, much lower standard. This port right here is, says it's M2-1. It says it right on the board. And each of the M.2 slots is written right there. M2-1. It's upside down for you guys. Um, yeah. So I'm going to put our Samsung 990. Let's zoom this back out for a minute. We've got our Samsung 990 Pro. This is a 4 terabyte, really fast Gen 4 drive. We'll use the Samsung Magician software when we get it all put together, which is fantastic software and well worth the extra price that uh, Samsung charges compared to some of the other competitors out there. And they have an excellent warranty. Uh, I believe it's a five-year warranty on these here. Yeah, five-year warranty. So let me go over to camera one here for just a moment because that camera is so tight. This one here, that for me to try and unbox this in this little window I've got is really hard. And I want you to watch the, there's no trickery I'm not doing anything outside of the camber frame. Is the dragon, Daniel in the chat wants to know if this dragon is metal or plastic. That sure feels like metal to me. Now, if it's aluminum, a magnet won't stick to it. So a magnet's not sticking to it. It feels like metal. Does it matter? Are you going to be touching it? <laughs> I think it's metal. But it's not steel. Like, it's, it's a cheap metal. It's probably like aluminum. But, I mean, who cares? But why do you ask? I guess that's what I want to know. Why do you want to know that? All right, let's... Um, so I encourage you to ask questions, but sometimes I don't understand the point of your questions. And maybe you're thinking of something I hadn't considered. I, when I ask why you're asking, it's not sarcastic. I genuinely don't know what I'm not understanding. What am I missing? All right, so here's the, here's the drive. And we'll take the drive out. Now, well, I've got you here on camera one. Samsung does a pretty good job of hiding the documentation. Not that we're going to use it, chalk. But you've got to separate these two pieces of plastic, that the container that it ships in. And we'll just pull that open. And there's your documentation. And we'll throw that in the motherboard box. And the rest of this can go in the recycle bin. We're done with that. Now, we'll switch back over to our close-up camera. We go and i personally want to use this slot first that's just traditionally what i do on my builds there's been a few builds where this is not the ideal slot now there is thermal tape you see this says remove see that you'd be surprised how many times i get customers bringing me systems where it clearly says remove and they have put a drive in doesn't necessarily hurt anything unless you've got a high-end drive like we've got that gets really hot and it just defeats the whole purpose of having this thermal tape because you're not using it in fact you're actually making it worse with this plastic tape but they don't want this to get contaminated with dust or dirt or to get torn in shipping so they cover it with a piece of plastic and you are supposed to remove that then we'll take our 990 pro here Find the slot just right there. And as I bring this little dial around, it's got to be in a certain position. Why is that not? There it goes. So it's got to be straight up and down, that extended piece. And then that's going to sit all the way down. Look how far down that goes. 
And then that little hang off is going to go. You see, if you look really closely, it's about as far as the camera can zoom. This piece here stops this. This is for opening and releasing the drive. And there's a little extended piece here that's going to go right on top of the drive and hold it down. Which I seem to be struggling with. And that would imply to me that I don't have the drive all the way down. When the drive is fully seated flush, this should close with ease. So bear with me as I monkey my way through this. This is supposed to be super easy. See how it's not holding the drive because I don't have it. Oh, I got it backwards. So this part here, this is when you, <laughs> you turn it towards your IO shield to release and you bring it towards you if you have the motherboard facing the same way. And that little arch there goes around that gold circle on the screw. See that? Making it essentially a toolless installation. And then we can remove same way, we can remove our, our tape. And you gotta remember which way this came off. And when I flipped this upside down, the little screw came out. So apparently these are not captive screws. Don't lose them and be aware that they are gonna fall out. And if you've got shag carpeting, you know, good luck finding it. Another reason that work on a nice clean workbench Yeah, I can see the cutouts that I'm, I'm, I'm like, am I putting this on in the right direction? I think I am. Remember when I said, um, it said mounting hole, and I was like, yeah, duh. <laughs> um, now I understand why that was there. Because the way it's cut out here, it looks like this could go on either direction, right? I'm just curious now. Can we flip this the other way? I don't think so. I think the I.O. panel gets in the way. No, that's not going to fit. Look how far to the left it has to go to get the screws to line up. And then it won't go close enough. So it definitely goes on this way. I'm wondering what the gold triangle is for. What the heck is that pointing to? The North Star? I understand when they use that gold triangle like on a, to guide you on the CPU install, right? We, we watch for that gold triangle. That one's right there. What's that one for? More decoration? Because that's a technical symbol. It's not a deck. It shouldn't be used as decor. Matt wants to know, do I still need to remove the film if I'm not putting an SSD in it? Well, again, the film is there to keep the thermal compound material, whether that's tape from getting dust, debris, just any sort of contamination. So if you're not using it and you take the tape off of it, then you're essentially inviting dust, dirt, and debris to get underneath there and contaminate your thermal pad. So you only remove the tape when you're going to use it. Once the tape's been removed, there's really no putting the tape back on. It's a one-way cats out of the bag type situation. So just bear that in mind that um, if you, like, let's say I change my mind and I don't want to put this NVMe in this slot. I want to put it in one of these slots instead. I can't put that tape back on. Or I might be able to today. It's not going to sit right, but I still have it. So once you've taken the tape off, it stays off forever regardless. So no, I would recommend you keep the thermal tape, the, the plastic tape protecting the thermal tape. Leave that alone until you're actually going to use it. But the other tape covering the heat sinks, you will be using those. Okay, another heat sink. Two more M.2s. Whoa, what is this? Oh, 
What is this? It's like a dummy drive or... I'll tell you what this appears to be for some reason is it looks like it's what's holding on this quick release lever and it also looks like it's lifting it up away from the board. So when this says remove, it's not referring to removing the whole piece. It's just referring to removing this tape. But it looks like if you wanted to put a smaller M.2 in here, a shorter one, that you could then remove this screw. Remember, I've never done this before. I've never seen this design, and I'm not looking at any documentation. I'm relying on my years of experience to try and figure out what this stuff is and why they engineered it that way. Interesting. Very interesting. So there's no other mounting points other than the one that's holding this in place. And that would be like a 2260. So I guess you could support a 2260 or 2280 and still keep this in place. You would just replace that screw with the standoff or the shorter, you know, the not as long M.2s that I, I've never even seen one in real life. The 2280s. Um, that refers to the, the NVMe drive being 22 millimeters wide and 80 millimeters long. So if it's a 2260, that means it's 60 millimeters long, 60 smaller than 80. They also make a 110, and that's a little bit longer. And I don't see any 110 support anywhere on this board, but I haven't looked under here yet. So in any event, there's no screws to put in here. It's interesting. Very interesting. Different design. Okay. Um, we can put that back on. Actually, no, let's leave that off because you know what? I think to get to this other side, this piece has to come off. Since this overlaps, this likely has to come off too. I'm guessing. But this looks like two pieces. So one screw here. Oh, isn't that interesting? Is that, that's just a plastic cover. That doesn't need to come off, Gary. Okay, well, we might be at documentation time because I can't figure out what's holding that in. Hmm. So we've got an M.2 slot here and an M.2 slot here right underneath these two, and something on this end by this screw. You know what? Maybe I do have to take this off. Maybe there's a hidden screw. And all this is is just a little plastic decorative piece right here. See this? And yes, there is a hidden screw right there. Yeah, they made that a little unnecessary. But that looked like it was two pieces, but it's just one big heat sink. Again, we've got our tape protecting our thermal tape underneath and tape protecting our... They've got thermal tape on the top and the bottom. So we've got that one M.2, second M.2, third M.2, fourth M.2, fifth M.2, and all have quick release. On cheaper boards, you might just have one quick release. And then the others are screws, and the others don't have heat sinks. All of this costs money. Extra cost extra. You know what? An OBS should have the ability to rotate this so you're looking at it the way I am. But I'm not quite sure how to do it. Try something here. Go to properties, figure video. Now this is giving me all colors and frequencies. Probably a really easy way to flip this. 
full screen. Screenshot. No, maybe it's a filter. Add filter. Video quality, noise suppression. Would that be on the camera, the video, video day, DST2? Hmm. Hmm. Probably something simple. Never done it before. Usually the first time you do something. is the hardest way you'll ever do it. And then when you do it again, it gets easier. That's pretty much fact of life, from cooking to riding a bicycle or playing an instrument. Color range, color space, frames per second, resolution. Hmm. Thought it would be just like a right click and a rotate option. Maybe something I have to play with after the show. Transform. Okay, transform, rotate 180 degrees. Hey, now when I put my hands here, you're getting the same view as my eyeballs. Could have used that 20 minutes ago, huh? Okay. So. This is just showing you what's under here. We're not going to use any of this. But it's there for uh, future up expandability and upgrades. Remember, these screws are not being held captive. And that means they'll just come out. And then you got to put one of these back and you might find that, uh-oh, screw's not there. In my case, it's just on the bench here. But before we put that piece back, this sits below it. And you can see the way it's cut here. It's going to go this. Don't over tighten these. It's just a decorative piece here, folks, and it's plastic. You don't even have to put that back, but it would look terrible if you didn't. It's just there for looks. Just like me. <laughs> I'm just decorative. I'm ornamental. I wish. Okay. Super easy. Um, this is a JIS, Japanese Industrial Standard. It's slightly narrower and can get in a little deeper on these screws than on American Phillips number one. You might get away with a Phillips number one, but I do a lot of work and um, it helps to have the right tool for the right job. These are cheap anyway. Get them on, you get them on uh, Amazon. The company that makes these Japanese tools, one of them that I like is called Hozan, H-O-Z-A-N. And I have a link to my Amazon store in the notes below this video. If you want to see all the parts I use and all the tools. Now, that leaves our CPU and our RAM, and we're already at the two-hour mark, where I typically like to end the videos. So I don't yet, you know, I've been thinking about well, how I'm going to cool this, and I don't this. And I don't yet have an answer. So I think we're going to go ahead and place the CPU in the RAM. And that, of course, requires us to remove, because I'm going to put the um, CPU contact frame on there. So let's go ahead and do that now. And then we might just have to save the test fire, unfortunately, because i got to figure out a cooler for this. Now, 
because I'm only going to test fire it, maybe install Windows. It's not like I have to put a, you know, really good cooler to keep it nice and cool under intense load. See all the VRMs down here. There's a lot of heat that's going to be generated through that. And just installing Windows and stuff is not that resource intensive. And if it is, it's just like a little peak here and there. So just putting on some kind of temporary cooler that's not going to be a pain in the butt to install would be ideal. Or I can wait. And this is what I'm thinking I'm going to do is I'll wait until this is all done and we can get the, uh, the old board out of Robot's Foot and use the cooler in Robot's Foot, which is what I intended to use to begin with. My only concern is that cooler was never designed for this chip and it may not be enough but it'll certainly be good enough to install Windows. And until I actually test it, it may actually be good enough to keep it on there. I hope it's good enough to keep on there because the cooler power supply and the case are all made by the same manufacturer and it all color matches beautifully. So that's my preference. But because that case is much older and the cooler is much older, it was never designed for this chip. So that means whether or not it will be good enough to keep the 14900K cool, we'll have to figure out for ourselves just through experience. Okay, so, uh, do, 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 do. you guys like that view better? Everybody agrees. Yeah. So I think what I'll have to do is I use the same, let me go back to camera one here so you can see what I'm talking about. I use this little cable right here as my, because this is the last cable I have on inputs on that capture card. On the four port capture card, we have camera one, camera two, close up camera, and HDMI output. That consumes all four ports. So, camera two, or rather, close up camera, may be the handheld camera that, um, that Mara may use, or that I might use from time to time, or Mitch might use. This is our handheld Sony. It looks a lot like the overhead Sony, but they're two different models. This is an $1,100 camera. That one is a vlogging camera. It's only like a $600 camera. So far as I can tell, they both do an adequate job for our needs here on YouTube. And I didn't want to spend $1,100 on a camera if the $600 camera is going to work. But if we're going to do it this way from this point forward, that means every time we move this cable to the other close-up camera, everything will be upside down. So maybe make a mental note to myself to create a second close-up camera so I don't have to keep manually switching it and remember to do that. I just have to remember to pick the right input. All right, uh, CPU time. So let me, let me put the CPU in first. We want to use the CPU to cover those pins and prevent them from being damaged as we take the contact frame out. So this original contact frame I don't know what you call it, retention bracket is gonna come out and then the contact frame will go in. And I've learned the order in which you do this can make the job easier. It's possible no matter what order you do it in, but I prefer to do it the easiest way possible because I'm lazy, I'm efficient. Yeah. Now this, if you've never seen one before, is how Intel is shipping their current flagship processors the consumer flagship processors. It's in very special packaging. You're paying for this, by the way. This is why part of the reason this chip costs so much money. If you recall, they used to have like the blue octagons. They've changed the packaging over the years. And then when it's just like a regular, all the other chips just go in a plain box that's super inexpensive. This is not inexpensive. This is like a little collector's item in here. What is this supposed to be? If you've ever seen the way CPUs are made, these the lithography machines essentially lay down on a round cylinder or round, it's a disc, it's not a cylinder. These little tiny squares could fit, I don't know, I'd have to count them, but maybe 70, 90 of these. Each one of those little squares gets cut out and that goes in the middle of the CPU. It's called a die, D-I-E. And that's your CPU. So on one of these round disks, there's like, I don't know, 70, 90. It depends on the chip. It depends on the size of the technology, the nanometers they're using. And it depends on the size of the disk that they're using. 
they're not all going to be good. Sometimes how they test will determine if it's a 14900K or a 13500. Sometimes they don't test well enough at all and they just have to be disposed of. Sometimes they test super well and they're called binned. That's called binning. That's when they take the best of the best and they'll make that a KS, 14900 KS, super. They manufacture in what's called a fab or a fabrication unit. So a fabrication unit is this giant facility that costs billions of dollars to manufacture just to make, to fabricate the fabrication facility. It's like Elon Musk says, you know, he has to build a machine to build the machines. So like a car company, when he's building Teslas, that factory that builds the cars is a machine. And that machine is building the cars, which are another machine. You gotta love Elon and the way his brain works, because he's not wrong. Now, to cut this open, we have a seam right across here. Just like that. Should be much easier to open than those blue octagons, or whatever the heck the dodecahedrons, whatever they were. When we open this up, we have the disc. And then glued right here, it's a little envelope. And that contains our instructions. And right there on the bottom, a Go Faster sticker. So we'll put that with the rest of the garbage uh, instructions. Now we have an empty box and this really cool cylinder um, or disc. I, I keep calling it a cylinder. I, I think a cylinder has depth and a disc is flat. But anyway, you see the little squares? It, it, so this is not, this is not a, a die. This is not a real die. It would be worth, well, you can imagine if each one of these CPUs is $500, $600, then how many of $500, $600 can you count each square? would be a processor. And of course, the ones on the edge, I don't know that it prints to the edge, but if it does, because it's lithography, they just cut those away because they're, they don't want to waste any space, you know? So I think they may actually come out of the factory just like this, but they're super thin, more like a record or a CD or a DVD. And then they're laser cut to separate all the little squares. And so in honor of the fabrication process, they've made the packaging look like that. And then we separate these two halves, like splitting open an Oreo cookie. Oh, and then the angels sing. Get that so the light's not reflecting so much. And so you have this special unboxing experience. So again, when you're wealthy and you think, oh, that's, what's unusual about that? <laughs> but for the rest of us, you're like, whoa, this is a completely useless piece of garbage, but I don't want to throw it away. Wouldn't it be a shame? It's kind of cool. I had people that asked me if they could get that little blue octagon thing that Intel used to use to turn it into a lamp. And a couple, Richard Palmentier turned his into a lamp, wasn't it? Wasn't it, Richard? Anyway, uh, I don't know what I'll do with it. Maybe just put it up here as decor like I did with the last one. But it's, uh, it's just kind of neat. Neat garbage. You're paying for it. I'm just saying. That chip would probably be 30 bucks cheaper if they didn't, if they just used the same ordinary packaging. And by the way, they will. Because if you buy a 12900K or a 13900K that are still being sold new today, They'll no longer be in the fancy packaging because they're no longer flagships. They're going to be in an ordinary blue box. They got demoted. <laughs> um, some people like to collect garbage. I'm sure people will contact me after the show. Can I have that? No, I'm not going to spend $20 to mail you a piece of plastic. All right. Uh, great. I just spit. Lovely. Try not to spit on your motherboard while you're working. Uh, the, 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 the chips don't like that. 
David Graham says that the discs are cut from cylinders. You know what? That makes sense. Dr. Dre says maybe they could have given you a cooler for what this cost. Not likely. This is going to need a, a better cooler. It's going to need like a, a cooler this big if it's an air cooler. And that's, you know, going to cost a lot of money to make. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is open up. Well, the first thing I need to do is go back to camera. Go back to this camera. There we go. So, okay, so we get this lever opened. This swings up backwards, like the hood on a Jaguar or Corvette. You know, they, they, it opens from the windshield. Normally, these open from the other way. But, hey, this is super fancy stuff here. And I think all socket 1700s open backwards. Well, to me, to me, that's backwards. Then we've got our chip, right? And uh, there's little cutouts in the plastic so you can grab the edges. Don't hold the chip from top to bottom. Always hold it by the edges. And that way, you know, I don't wear an anti-static strap because there's nowhere for the static to go that's harmed, harmful. Anything I touch with my hands are, are grounded areas. So even if I build a static charge, it will only dissipate into uh, the metal heat sinks, which are grounding points. So uh, no harm. If you're not touching the actual componentry or circuit board, then you don't have to worry about an anti-static roof strap. Now we're going to set this into the socket. You'll notice the little gold triangle, super, super tiny right there. But you'll also notice there are little cutouts, little notches in the top and bottom, and they're offset. They're not directly above and below. So that way you can't put it in upside down. And I believe it's going to go in this way with the words facing me. And I'm going to just put it in on an angle right up against the edge of the frame without any downward pressure. And it's definitely not seating flat. So I'm going to just give a very light little, and it just with a light little assistance there, it fell into the socket. It slipped in there. And those pins are just underneath, but they're not touching the bottom of the CPU. It's resting just above it. When we lower this, that's, this is going to put pressure down, and it's going to push the CPU down onto those pins. Those pins are very, very delicate, and I cannot stress this part of this requires care and attention, your full attention. Hey, there's Raj D in the chat with a five-pound super chat. It says, happy Friday. Thank you, Raj, and happy Friday to you too, my friend. Just want to scroll through the chat and see what else I've been missing here. I think I got the contributions. That's my primaries to say thank you to those people kind enough to contribute. Now, um, to replace the contact frame, ordinarily we would just, you know, take this plastic cover off. You, you see me do that a thousand times. So we're going to put the contact frame on, and I've never done this on Intel. I've only done this on AMD. And it's completely pointless on the AMD because the AMD is a square chip. It's not going to warp. I don't think this is going to warp either unless you really overvolt and overclock it for hours and hours and hours. And even then, I'm not sure. But I just have fun. I <laughs> just enjoy putting these on. Authentic tag, scratch to check. What am I scratching? Oh, it makes little squares. Weird. Well, it's really important that my piece of metal is authentic. That's all it is. There's nothing electronic in here. It's just a piece of metal. God forbid I got a knockoff one. We've got a little Torx wrench here that's used to take these screws out. And unlike the AMD, we're going to reuse these screws. On AMD, it comes with screws to replace so that's an interesting difference between the AMD socket and the Intel socket with regards to putting one of these on. So the idea behind this is it's going to give us, again, you've got a, the triangle here. It's going to give us even pressure across this rectangular shape. So our heat sink is less likely going to have any warpage issues. Now, in theory, that makes sense. In reality, 
does it actually do anything? I'm skeptical. And I will make a video comparing with and without a contact frame on a 14900K build that we've already done. And we'll see if I'm right or I'm wrong. Now these screws, in my experience, have been surprisingly loose. Oh yeah, I mean, they are barely, I don't know if you can tell just how lightly those screws are turned. And I don't know why. You'd think something that important would be really, really secure, but across the board, whether we're dealing with AMD or Intel, these contact frame screws are very uh, loose. I mean, they're, when they're tightened down, they're just snug. Now you see on AMD, it's all a big frame. On Intel, it's two pieces, or at least, I assume it's the same on all Intels, but it's, I've never taken one apart before on Intel. This is my first time. Be gentle. And we're gonna reuse those screws, so I'm gonna take those screws out, set those aside. Now I'm gonna put this in with the rest of the spare parts in case we wanna put it back the way it was. Now we're gonna take even this whole lid, everything comes off here. So I don't, I don't wanna expose the pins, that's why I put the CPU in first. And I realized with that camera being directly overhead, you're just seeing the top of my hands. And it's hard to do this one-handed and to show you, but you can use your imagination that I am turning a screw. Now that comes out and you see how now we've got this all protected. And then this piece here, Dump those screws out. And don't do this over your motherboard like I'm doing, but I'm trying to go to the camera. And uh, we're going to reuse the screws. And you need these two pieces. I'll just put back in the bag the uh, contact frame came in. Keep them together. So nobody wonders, what's this for? Keep these together. And that will go in with the documentation in the motherboard box, along with any spare screws or anything like that. So now you can see this is fully exposed and we can take our contact frame and we can just gently set it right on top. Now, normally on a regular ATX or micro ATX board, all the writing on the CPU and the contact frame all that writing, like this word Meg, it's all facing the same way. It can change with some other boards, particularly mini ITX, but it's almost universal on AMD and Intel ATX and micro ATX board that the writing will all be facing the same direction from the top to the bottom in this perspective that I'm giving you right now. And then we're going to take the screws we removed and we'll just put them right back in. Now I am a little concerned that nothing is holding the back plate in. So I don't know if I'll be able to tighten these. If the plate fell back, then the screws aren't gonna start. And yeah, you see the plate came out. There was nothing holding it in. However, there's really no other way to do this that I'm aware of on this platform where you can put one screw in, you know what I mean? Because we have to take the entire thing off. So in this case, we got a little creative here. So I'm gonna have to, again, I hold everything by the edges. I don't touch any of the electrical components. And I'm gonna take the contact, or the uh, back plate rather, and I'm gonna just try and hold it in the right place until I can at least get one of the screws started. And this is gonna be a little tricky because I can't see where the where the hole is, I've got a feel for it. That seems about right. Yeah, I got that one. Let me go to the opposite corner. Once I get these two in, then everything should line up. And we just want to get them started. We don't want to... No, I lied. The back plate just came off. <laughs> so the AMD platform makes this a little easier. Now, I just noticed this does have some writing on it, and there isn't really a right side up or down with this, but I, I suppose if you wanted to read it properly, 
Imagine flipping this board over, you'd want it in that direction. On the other hand, they do have a corner cutoff indicating they want it to go on with the triangle. And that would make the writing upside down. That's, that's interesting. All right, well, we'll put that right back. It does appear also, this will only go on in one direction, as I'm just noticing, as I, I've never taken one of these apart. These two screws are closer together. These two screws are further apart. So that does matter. And then this material is to prevent damage to the back of the motherboard. So everything has a reason. And I'm just working blindly trying to feel where that's going and I cannot. I'm not even close. Let's try that right there. Oh, that's definitely started. If you over tighten, you can always loosen. That's the good news. I believe I've started it correctly, and we should be able to just take all of these, get them all a little started here, just little by little. And as soon as it starts to be, give you any, like I'm just going to use two fingers. And the minute I can't spin that screw with two fingers, I'm going opposite corners. Because we want this completely level. Opposite corners, as much tension as two fingers can give it here. Now remember, on the board it wasn't very tight, so now I'm just going to guess, turn it to about where I felt it was approximately at. That may even be a little bit more than it was. I can't imagine it's going to hurt anything. I'm sort of winding it back to get an idea of how much tension, and I'm just using muscle memory to kind of gauge what it felt like when I took them off. It's not rocket science, and it doesn't have to be precise. You just got to get it close enough. And I'm going to say that's probably dead on. Now, when our heat sink goes on this, it's going to be a much smoother, flatter surface overall. If you have a giant heat sink that overlaps the CPU, we have a little lip around it, but Nonetheless, uh, memory can go in now. We've got a little diagram here that shows us right here. And again, you can always go to the manual, but I also just generally look at the board because when I'm doing field service work with a client's machine, I'm relying on reading the motherboard for stuff. And if I can't find it, then I'll have to go to a, another computer or use my phone to pull a PDF file because I can guarantee the customer never, ever as the manual. And you'll notice right here it says first, and it's telling us it wants us to use this socket, skip one, and the other one. So it's calling it DIMM B2 and A2. So since we're only using two memory modules, you could, in theory, put those memory modules in any of these sockets. But if you want the best performance and reliability, you will use what's they, what they recommend. Now, as you can see, it's all brand new. Everything we're using here is all new stuff. People often ask, how often do you get stuff that doesn't work that's brand new? Very rarely. What I love about filming live without any edits is you get to see everything as it's happening, the condition it's in when it's unboxed, and then when we do our first power on self-test, I think we've only had one issue with a bad power supply many years ago. And I think we had an issue with bad RAM, but it's after how many builds? Now, I usually open all of these retention levers up just to give me room to work. And I'm going to take our first DDR5 module. I'm going to look for any plastic over the company's name or over the heat shield. And clearly, we've got a piece of plastic that is intended to be removed before installation. Sure would be nice if they wrote the word remove across it. 
All this is going to do is retain heat and dull the look of your RAM if you don't remove it. There may be one on the other side. There is not. There's a notch, so this only goes in one way. So you put it into the track very gently. Make sure that it's in. Don't use any brute force. Then we're going to use thumbs and a lot of weight to push down one side and then the other side. That is 48 gigs of RAM with an RGB top. We're going to repeat the exact same process into that other slot, skipping a slot in between. That's how we get to our first, what they call channel, to be in what's called dual channel mode, which adds performance to your computer at no additional cost if you just plug it in the right slots. <laughs> it's no secret. They tell you right on the board. OK. And what happened to my video? Did I bump something? Oh, I ran out of battery. <laughs> that is perfect timing that my battery died because, remember I said I hadn't charged it before the show and I wasn't sure how much life was left in it. Well, now we know. And it couldn't have happened at a better time because we are now at a, about a half an hour over what I like to do. Let me just get this camera out of the way here. Bear with me. just one moment. There we go. Um, I don't really have any way to test fire this. However, um, we could, I've got the flash drive with the latest BIOS. We could do the BIOS flashback. Now, the BIOS flashback, in theory, can be done with the RAM and CPU in place, but it really shouldn't be. This is something I kind of, well, not kind of, I forgot. And I was going to see if these cheap flash drives work on MSI. I know they work on ASRock's BIOS flashback because I used one and they work fine. But will it work on the MSI? Because on that one, at least in our past experience, the, the, the cheap flash drive didn't work. And I intended to try it on this. And then I forgot. So we're not going to do that today. And we're already a half an hour past where I wanted to be. And I don't have any way to test fire this until I get the board out of robot's foot, put this board in and put that cooler on. So I think we're kind of stuck for right now. I like to be able to show what we've accomplished to prove that we've done everything correctly and all our parts are working. But in this case, I'm gonna make an exception. This is a big, expensive, powerful motherboard. And I don't wanna cut any corners or rush anything through. So consider this part one. I'm sure it's going to boot just fine. Likely the BIOS is going to recognize that chip. If, the, if I turn this on for the first time, which will be when it's in, well, I don't physically, yeah, I do. I have to physically put the motherboard tray back in because the cooler's mounted to the case. The cooler doesn't come out with the motherboard tray. So this will have to go into the motherboard tray. The motherboard tray has to go into the case. Then I can put the water block on it, and then I'll be able to turn it on for the first time. If I, when I do that, if the system never posts a video screen, it's likely because the BIOS doesn't recognize the 14th gen chip because this is a 13th gen and 12th gen motherboard. It is also 14th gen compatible with a BIOS update, but that BIOS mail, that latest BIOS may already be on here, or at least the one latest enough to recognize the chip. I don't know how old this inventory is, but rest assured, if they're still manufacturing the board, whatever BIOS is available at the time of manufacture is the BIOS you get. They don't just put one BIOS on it and then release new BIOSes while still manufacturing new boards with old BIOSes. They don't do that. So depending on how old the board is, the BIOS version will vary. And then typically, well, it kind of depends how often they come out with BIOS updates and why. There still may be a newer version of BIOS. Even if it's only been two weeks since the board's been manufactured, it's quite possible there's a new BIOS available. And um, I like to have the latest BIOS. Whether or not I need it to recognize the CPU, I might need it for RAM compatibility or security fixes. So <clears throat> it'll leave us on a cliffhanger. Will it boot? And if not, what are we going to do?
we should be able to use the BIOS flashback if it doesn't boot without having to remove the stuff. But it is recommended that you do it before putting all the stuff in if you're going to do it. And I was going to do it. The good news is I have a second motherboard. So we'll use this and do the BIOS flashback on the second build, which might be for a while. But I will do that for you. I'm also curious myself if these little $2 flash drives are going to be good enough. Because according to what I read, and I find Reddit to be a pretty reliable source, these work. And unlike the SanDisk cheap one I was using from SanDisk, these have LEDs so I can see what the heck's going on. Matt wants to know if you should install a beta BIOS. I wouldn't unless the beta BIOS is addressing an issue I'm having. And the manufacturers will tell you that on their page. Um, any other questions? Nick Caffrey says bio, ASRock doesn't have a BIOS flashback. Sure it does. What did I just show you last week? Wasn't that, a, wasn't that ASRock? It wasn't Gigabyte. No, it was ASRock. You can't do this to me, man. I'm getting too old for this stuff. You're telling me I didn't do something I just said I did? The video's proof. It wasn't ASRock. What was it? Go back in my video library. Go back about a week or two. So not every motherboard is going to have BIOS flashback. It's usually only the high-end motherboards. Um, and sometimes like um, because of the frequency that AMD releases new chips that are compatible with the older sockets and chipsets, a lot of AMD boards have that so that you can upgrade your CPU. On the other hand, you really don't need it if you're, let me rephrase, if you're upgrading your CPU, you can do a traditional BIOS update with the old CPU before you take it out. But if you're building a new chip, new computer, with an old motherboard, and when I say old, I mean like it's new from Newegg or Amazon, but it's last year's model motherboard, but it's compatible with this year's model CPU. So you buy both things new, but that motherboard's been sitting on a shelf and doesn't have the latest BIOS. And when you put it together, it won't post because it doesn't recognize the chip. You use the BIOS flashback option unless you have access to an older chip. I hope I haven't confused you because I think I just confused myself. <laughs> All right. Will there be a live stream tomorrow? I don't know. Um, no, actually, I do know. There will not be. There will not be a, a live stream tomorrow. No. Sorry. I, I forgot. I have an appointment. Other questions? Do you have a link to the BIOS you used? You simply go to the motherboard manufacturer's website for the make and model of board we have here. You click on support and you click on BIOS. I'm sure you don't need me to spoon feed that to you. And I don't know why you would want to do that if you don't have the board, unless you're curious what the, because uh, I don't know what version of BIOS we have right? But if you want to go see on any motherboard you ever see anybody working on, you can be self-reliant. You don't need to ask that question. It's always the same answer. You go to the motherboard manufacturer's website for this model of board and you click the support button. Under the support button, you'll see what CPUs are supported, what RAM has been tested with it, the manual, the user manual, and uh, the BIOS updates and drivers, okay? I'd like you guys to, you know, I'm a teach a man to fish kind of guy versus a feed a man a fish. You feed a man a fish, you feed him for one day. You teach a man to fish, he eats for life. All right, guys. Now, um, I think that's gonna wrap it up for us. And again, I want to thank everybody who has contributed to the show today. These videos, again, 
would not be possible without your contributions and your support. And so glad that we don't have to sit here and spout manufactured nonsense uh, and, and get their approval for what we're doing. This keeps us independent. And it's not often that we can spend this kind of money because I could probably do four projects, four separate video projects for what this one project's gonna cost. But because this board was a third of its normal price, it made it more affordable. Although the CPU is still, and the RAM are very expensive and the SSD are very expensive. So I can't afford to do this very often. However, uh, we do have a need for it for video editing purposes and um, we'll put Mara to work on it when it's done. And then we'll get the big Apache helicopter back, which is a 10th, 10th Gen 900. And we'll probably pull the board out of that and we'll take the board we're taking out and put it in there. So that'll be a 13900. Then we'll take that 10900 and we'll put that into another case. And when this is all said and done, we're going to have three builds. So that was worthwhile for me to make that investment so I can get all of that content out of it. Squeeze it like a, squeeze it like an orange. I want to get every drop of orange juice out of that. And I thank you all for making that possible. Now, that's going to wrap it up for me for today. Again, I want to thank Acronis, Instant House Call, RoboForm, and of course, VIP CDK deals. Those specials are all... Um, well, Instant House Calls are not all year. It might still be, but for right now, Instant House Calls just for like three months. But all the sales, all the specials, those are for the entire year this year from Acronis, RoboForm, and VIP CDK deals. Those discounts, you don't have to rush. There's no pressure. I'm not twisting your arm. If and when you need it, save some money, use our coupon codes and our links. With Instant House Call, we're kind of sticking our toe in the water. We'll see how the first three months goes. And uh, if they choose to, they'll extend that. And that might end up being for the whole year. We'll keep our fingers crossed and hope so. So if you want to take advantage of the discount, uh, that offer is good until the end of March for right now. And perhaps he'll extend it. We're going to have Corey Fruitman from Instant House Call on. I believe he's scheduled next Friday. So part two for this uh, obviously won't be next Friday. I'm not sure yet. If we'll do this in the middle of the week, I have a bunch of mini PCs from Patrick and um, I have that. I have a couple other things I need to review and I'm not sure if we'll have time to get back to this till a week later. I'm not sure yet. So still a lot of things in flux as we go live here and things are rapidly shifting. We we're flexible and we adjust. So uh, we'll get to it. We'll get back to it, ASAP, as soon as time permits. All right, guys. And unless, and I should also mention, if Corey should choose to reschedule, I don't think that's gonna happen. That's why I say everything's always in flux and until we're pretty close to the to the airing date, I'm not quite positive <laughs> what's going to happen. It's a little bit crazy doing these live videos because we're so, we're able to quickly respond to anything going on that we can shift and move things at a moment's notice. So because this is not, there's no customers waiting on this. This is a channel project. We're under no time constraint to get this done right away. So you'll have to potentially be a little patient and we'll get it done. And if you're just kind of curious how this looks in this stage, and then if you're curious about that back plate that I was holding on to, it's this right here. And you see there's a giant cutout from the protective metal they've got back here to protect the back of the board. And that's for any um, support mechanisms like for liquid coolers, because otherwise they wouldn't fit without that big cutout. So they've considered that on this board design. Thank you to Mara, as always, for the fantastic work she's done on the thumbnail. It's a fantastic thumbnail today. She spent a lot of time on it. It's very creative. Got to love all the detail in it. And, of course, um, thanks to you all for joining me, for your contributions. 
And I, it's just now occurring to me, I have not checked my phone this entire broadcast. So before we end, let me just see if I've missed anything here where I want to acknowledge some folks. And yes, indeed, we have an Amazon gift card for $50. This comes from Rad. Rad says, Carrie, I hope you enjoy this Amazon gift card. I was curious if you ever tried out the TP-Link BE800 tri-band Wi-Fi router, or if you sent it back to Amazon. I was looking at the BE550 for my small home, and I was waiting on your take of those routers. Thanks for your time, and I love your shows. Take care, Rad. Well, I think I said this on my review of the TP-Link router, was that my intention was to keep it, to replace my Netgear Nighthawk, which was, he's getting old, still good but, you know, didn't support the latest Wi-Fi 7. And I also probably said that if this thing, this new TP-Link sucks, I'll go back to my Netgear. I'm happy to report that Netgear is... Um, well, I guess I can continue that. The Netgear is in storage, and I've been using the TP-Link Wi-Fi 7 since the day I made that video, and it's been fantastic. I love it. Thank you for the uh, Amazon gift card, Rad, and thank you for the question. And then it looks like uh, he sent an email, and Mara's already answered him, so thank you for that. And Frankie B, once again, Frankie B has given us a very, very generous Amazon gift card. And um, we're going to see what we can do to help Frankie B in return. So I'm going to have to have a, a phone conversation with him. Uh, holy cow, I can't tell you how much this means to me and how, how important it is for the community that we're able to have this financial independence. And so these Amazon gift cards are fantastic because Amazon doesn't take any commission like PayPal or even, you know, your YouTube contributions. YouTube is taking 30% of your membership and 30% of your super chat. And then they make me or any creator wait 30 to 60 days to receive it. You also can't ask for a refund from YouTube. They won't refund your money. I have no control over it. PayPal, if people contribute via PayPal, I get the money right away. PayPal takes 3%. But I'm probably going to spend the money on Amazon so I can buy more stuff. So if you buy an Amazon gift card, I get every single penny immediately. And if you decide you made a mistake, I didn't mean to send you 500, I meant to send you 50 and I hit an extra zero, I can just send an Amazon gift card right back instantly and you know i have control over that whereas with youtube's payments nobody has control over that other than youtube and they're pretty stern about not giving people refunds and it you know don't be mad at me <laughs> so you have multiple ways to support the channel also by sharing the videos by participating in our chat by being a member um, just by being a nice person that's kind in our chat room even if you don't participate in chat and you're just watching the videos and you give it a thumbs up, that's always appreciated. If you subscribe, you know, those likes and subscribes help the search engine offer this content to newer viewers who haven't seen it before. And if they like it, they'll stick around, be a part of the community, and we can watch the community grow with more like-minded, kind, and supportive individuals from all over the world. How cool is that? So if you haven't, yeah, I'd appreciate it if you click the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Hit the bell icon. In fact, I've got a little graphic for that to show you what that looks like if you're new here. And even if you're watching on a television, like on a Samsung TV, if you've got YouTube app open, you can usually just hit the enter button and hold it down. And you'll see during the video options pop up. Or you can go and use the arrow buttons to go to the content creator's name. And you click on that, and then you'll see the options for subscribing and thumbs up and all that other stuff. You do have to be logged in with a free YouTube account, or none of that works. So if you're 
watching on an app on a TV and you never signed into the app, then there's some features that aren't available to you because of that. But it is free to create an account. And uh, you can do that through your cell phone or through a computer, or you can painfully do it through your television and choose every letter. It's a pain in the butt. Or your fire stick or however you're watching the show. I think about 20, 25% of viewers watch us on their televisions. And they are not aware that these optional controls are even available because it's not obvious. You've got to hold the button down on the remote. All right, guys. Um, and d different TVs and different devices, Roku's, it's going to be different. But push around on the buttons and you'll figure it out. That's going to wrap it up for me for today. We're just about at a three-hour mark. I think it's a good place to wrap up. Thank you all again. Um, I will see you all again very, very soon. If not Sunday, definitely Monday. Because every Monday, we do our members-only videos. So for members, which is a much smaller crowd that joins us, so it's not so chaotic. And it's a little more intimate, and it's loose. I don't have to worry about being scrutinized and magnified everything I say because I know the members are friends. Um, they're friendly to the channel and they're not gonna scrutinize me. And that really, you know, the bigger the channel gets, the more scrutiny. And it drives me crazy that people have nothing else better to do than try to demonize or find a reason to rage. There's gotta be better things to do that are more healthy mentally than, but I can't stop it. But with members only, I, I really enjoy those videos, especially because I know everybody watching and participating are supporters, they're friends. and those are a lot of fun. Now, these public videos are fun too, but sometimes they get, they have a, a, um, a rough edge to them <laughs> that, that can get a little bit grating after a while. So I really, really enjoy those members only videos because they're always rewarding for everybody. And um, if you're not a member, check it out and be a part of the, this closer, um, family where I don't have to be as professional. I can relax a little bit. And um, it's just a more informal thing. And then, of course, uh, Fridays, we always go live. Whether it's Monday or Friday, it's always 12 p.m. Pacific time and 3 p.m. Eastern until daylight saving, and then it moves up an hour. But right now, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. And it'll be that way until... Well, like I say, until daylight saving. Now, the Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, I broadcast as time permits. Like last week, I think I broadcasted every day last week. It depends on how busy my real business gets. A lot of times I can postpone work and do it in the evening when the business is closed. People have gone home for the day. I don't have to get in the traffic. I, if I have to drive over there, I drive at night. I have keys, alarm codes to get into the building. That enables me to free my day up to do these videos. If you're wondering how, if Kerry's so busy, how does he have time to make all these videos? Because I work until three o'clock in the morning. A lot of people don't put it all together, but it, the answer is pretty obvious if you think about it. And sometimes, and it doesn't happen often, thank goodness, but sometimes a customer has a problem and they need me there right now. And if that's the case, then the video has to be put second. Customer always has to come first. And that's why I can't tell you for sure about Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays and weekends, because I still have to get haircuts and dentist appointments and doctor appointments and get the car in for service like everybody else. And I cannot do this and that at the same time. And all that has to be done during normal business hours versus my business for my clients. I get to go at night, which has a lot of benefits, let me tell you. And then I can do both. So... Just to answer that, I see that question a lot and people make it out like I'm a hypocrite when they simply, rather than ask, they make an accusation. And it's just the way the world is. People are very quick to demonize and think everybody's lying to them. And with all the scammers out there, I can't say I blame them, but you know, asking a few questions to confirm what you think is true before jumping to the conclusion might make for a little less bumpy of a conversation. All right. That'll wrap it up. I will see you all very, very soon. Until next time, bye for now. Don't have an outro ready, so bear with me for a second. Here we go.